to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. Gonna slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. All right, here we go. We're back in the booth here at the bomb hole, which is presented by none other than Pub Beer. Now. First things first, always got to ask, Stony Buds, how are we doing today? So good, my dog. That was a good one. Rolled Thank off good. Nice. Thank you. Uh, to my left, we have Trevor Graves in the booth. Trevor, how are we doing? Fabulous. <laughs> we are happy to have you, Trevor. Uh, for our listeners that are unfamiliar with you and what you've done in your career, uh, I'll, I got a little summary of uh, Trevor's career here. Trevor Graves is a creative genius who has been pivotal to the direction of snowboarding and snowboard photography. He was the first to take a conceptual approach to snowboard photography. Many riders have built their careers on Trevor's photos, like Todd Richards, uh, Jeff Brushy. He also founded Nemo, a design firm that has clients from Robot Food to Nike to freaking any company you've probably ever heard of. Uh, Trevor is a pillar in the snowboard community and has continued, has contributed to the culture of snowboarding for decades. So, uh, yeah. Let's just get right into it, Trevor. Let's talk about the early days, where you're from. Thanks for the intro. Appreciate it. It's good to be here. <laughs> um, the early days, <clears throat> go back in time. I think uh, you got to kind of place it. I'm growing up in a small town, 4,000 people, Chittenango, New York. It's a birthplace of L. Frank Baum, uh, the author of The Wizard of Oz. And we had... Um, we didn't have skateboard magazines. We didn't have internet. We didn't have skateboard shop. We didn't have anything going on. But we had a friend, Ronnie Bruno, that would go down to skate with uh, down in Clearwater with Mike McGill and uh, Alan Gelfin during his Easter break with his grandma. And he'd bring back skateboard mags and um, skateboard tricks and um, teach us on what to do. And it's just interesting in that time and era of watching how styles would be really, in that time, just regional because you get to travel, you go to Rhode Island or you go to Buffalo, and it would be different in what they would want to do. And so really, Rodney Mullen, all those Florida cats would kind of influence us, uh, as well as what we could figure out from looking at a skateboard picture from California. And then, you know, skateboarding is fun. You know, you start to be separate. You're going, you know, I just remember the day at baseball, like, we won, we lost a game. I had a good game because, you know, I'm really good at baseball. And I go, yeah, coach, I don't have to run, right? He goes, no, Graves, you got to run three extra laps. Like, fuck this. Like, grab my skateboard, my cleats on, and just poof, quit. Action sports, gone. I mean, action sports, is it's all me now. And um, it's it's just such a cultural move back then. But I think in 1980, I made my first board in shop class. Wood, you cut it out, and it was more like a piece of plywood, and you try to bend it. And, you know, Mr. Wood, our uh, shop teacher, Missing thumb included. <laughs> Let's get Mr. Wood in there. Lost it on the bandsaw or whatever. <laughs> so classic, right? <laughs> and, um, and built these boards. And the other thing we're trying to do is build skeeters. Like you put the, at a Dogtown deck with the trucks and you put wood skis on the bottom from the garage sale. And, you know, I thought waxing the board was candle wax. So I was dripping that on there and trying to make it work. And uh, it, it had potential, but just, we were just so out there, just couldn't really get it going. And then you finally get to hold of a board probably in 88. You start seeing more at the BMX shop. And speaking of BMX, it's like down the street from me was, um, I don't, I'm sure you all know who Dave Mira is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That nine-year-old would come over and ride my quarter pipe. <clears throat> he had his little BMX gang and Ronnie and Corey and Billy Jarvis. We'd all kind of skate on my ramp. We were the skateboard gang. Not really a gang, but we'd hang. And, you know, this kid is phenomenal. Oh, BMX is easy. Even nine-year-olds can do it. Little did we know that, <laughs> that guy was going to be a phenom. Um, and rest in peace, Dave. Yeah, it was it was a great run. Good people. And then Billy Jarvis, the other guy on our crew, was part of that early X game. So I don't know if you remember that one. It was in Maryland. You had the luge. You had shovel racing, like little weird events back then. But he was um, actually an action figure uh, and did pretty decent in luge. So that was his claim to fame. Luckily for the United States, he's up in Alaska, and he won't affect anything down here because uh, that guy, you wind him up, and the whole thing would be ruined. <laughs> uh, yeah, love Billy. 
And then um, you figure out, like, I went to college again, and that's where I met uh, this guy, Scott Klum. And he, Scott's a, he's a big, he's a big part of the early days of snowboarding. But what he would do is somehow he finagled his way to go live in Tom Sims's tree fort in Santa Barbara. And then he was sponsored by Sims out of New York. And so, you know, in the East Coast, it was all Burton, Flight, um, those kind of brands. You didn't really see Sims out there. They're really hard to get a Sims board at all. Super expensive. I think it was $350 for a board back then. And <clears throat> he had them. So he'd get the Sims team on the nose, and then that's what we'd get to see. So when I tried that first board, I had to try it goofy-footed because he's goofy-footed, and he wouldn't switch it around for me. And then that's, um, you know, there's some of those photos that we took there that really kind of set the stage for me. What Scott and I would do is, you know, we'd hear his brother say, yeah, it snowed. Okay, cool. We went to this farmer's lot with barbed wire fence around it, and we'd build quarter pipes because he would also be involved with uh, Chantry and Kidwell and Alan Armbruster and those guys in the Tahoe dump days. So he would bring all that stuff back to us. Actually, I remember having a VHS tape, like a dupe of a dupe of, those sessions it was you know not edited it was just one roll mike chantry just blah 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 you gotta get him on the show that guy and then um i remember going to ames his department store and putting it in the machine to watch it because i didn't i didn't have enough money to get it to get a tape recording machine so you'd watch at the store and that's how you'd learn just watch figure out oh that's what you do okay we'll dig a we'll dig a jump okay cool and then we took these pictures um and we were in college, so I got um, work financial aid. So my job was the photo uh, studio manager because I really hadn't picked up a camera until I got to college. And then um, Scott and I would drive all the way back to Utica, New York, open up the lab at midnight, get the chemicals going, get your negatives out, start making contact sheets. By 3 in the morning, you're making 5 by 7 prints because you're too cheap to, you know, do the full 8 by 10. And then, um, you know, one thing leads to another. Yeah, that's amazing. What year were we, are we talking with those prints? Uh, I was in, that was 85. I think, yeah, 85. I met Clum, fall 84. And that winter we started snowboarding. So it was probably, um, yeah, maybe even October 84, 85. Well, let's dig into that. Uh, what kind of camera were you using? Uh, shouts out to my sister. Give her a horn. I still, I mean, I borrowed her Minolta X370 because um, I didn't have a camera, but she had one. Actually, I remember going into high school. I was super curious about the dark room, and I remember sneaking in during my lunch class, and Connie Denchy, our art teacher, she's an old crabby lady. She catches me in there and sends me down to the office to get me suspended because she thought I was stealing stuff. I don't know, but it didn't discourage me. I kept going, but, yeah, that was sort of the intro there. That was that little Minolta. And what inspired you to actually shoot these photos in the early days? Because you probably didn't know where you were going to do with them, you know? Yeah, there wasn't a magazine at that time, and it was more just documenting it. I think, you know, in high school, you wanted to be somebody like, you want to be on the Powell team. Oh, I'm going to be a pro skateboarder. Well, I suck at it. I'll show you all my broken bones. I'm really bad at skateboarding. Um, but I love it. And then... Um, so I'm going to be a real good snowboarder. I'm not really good at it either. I'm okay, but I'm not great. And then next thing is, like, well, I guess I'll be the photographer. And I'm sure there's it's come through this. There's crews, you know, JP, his crew. There's always, like, the alpha alpha male, and then there's the crew, you know. And if you don't have the crew that's kind of supporting that, then nobody else sees that the alpha is actually that good because it's all so done so remotely. Yeah, we've... We can we can share stories all day long on that stuff. <laughs> so yeah, I was that guy. I was the I was the picture taker guy because Scott was a much a better athlete than I was for sure. Another thing that's kind of interesting to think about at this time is that you're taking photos which have become iconic photos in snowboarding, but there was no blueprint. There was mm. no photos that you could base your your photography off of. It seemed like mm. in skating there was cool photos, but then. Mm. I, I was watching something where you're talking about skiing was shot like from the bottom, blue sky in the background, mm -hmm. long lens, and you were kind of, uh, do you want to talk about your approach mm. to taking photos? Well, I'll actually disagree with you. I think the, the blueprint was definitely Grant Britton and Casimus, um, James Casimus, so all the guys shooting skateboarding. 
And you got to think about what I had available in front of me. I didn't have powder. Uh, and early, early on, it's really Bud Fawcett, Sonny Miller. Um, even Tom Sims were kind of the first guys shooting snowboarding. And it wasn't really like the category of snowboard shooting or kind of, I think Bud was kind of maybe the first. Cause Sonny was coming out of, um, out of surf. And then, you know, later after we built the stage, it gave the guy Motel and John Foster and all those guys the ability to come in from surf and be able to be Transworld snowboarding. Uh, but we were there first, man. Just just claiming it right here forever. <laughs> <laughs> and then skateboarding was the influence. So, again, look at where I'm at. I'm in the East Coast, ice conditions, um, and then Stratton and the whole legacy of the Stratton pipe and what it brought to East Coast snowboarding. And then, you know, think about it as far as demographics, the concentration of just people. It's just so many more people in New England than throughout most of the states, except for California. And so you had a ton of people out there. So I didn't realize that I was set myself up. So again, when the opportunity came to become the International Snowboard Magazine East Coast correspondent, well, I'm on it. Five bucks a week, I'm in. Let's go. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I forgot about ISM Magazine. You can't. It's yeah. the beginning. That is the beginning. That is it. Tom Shea, and really smart guy. Like he's a big politician down in the Bay Area. And um, he saw, he, again, entrepreneurially, he saw the vision of what snowboarding could be and then um, built that and gave us all a platform uh, to be able to kind of showcase, hey, here's what we're doing in our neck of the woods. But, yeah, it was, it was um, it's, it's, what's great is it's a time that can't ever be created and it's only done once and it's up you know podcasts like this that are going to give an opportunity to lay that footprint down to go hey here's what it is you know if somebody wants to make that snowboard history movie like you guys are going to have all the stories and (laughs) pick and choose right because it wrote itself um, i'm sure it's going to be entertaining 100 percent now talking about uh earlier you mentioned scott Mm clum uh the front side air photo of him on that sims is that taken in the this time period yeah that's 85 um he he was out of south new berlin um just outside of utica new york and they lived out in a you know a small farming community out there and then he had scouted this location and just waited for conditions in the wind to be going in the right direction in order Mm -hmm. to make a snow drift because you needed the snow drift to dig in the vert Uh, you couldn't just like have a you know, a hill, you needed that drift to get the, get the vert, to get the pop and then enough snow to get the run in. So it's fast enough. So if you really look at the picture, you can see the grass poking out on the hill. And then I think that the really iconic part that'd probably be funny for kids today is what he's wearing. Cause again, he didn't have Burton snow gear. You didn't have Gore-Tex invented yet. You didn't have boots. <laughs> you didn't have bindings hardly. Um, and he was wearing, if you really look at it, he had a wetsuit on. So, again, you're always sitting in the snow, putzing with your bindings to get them on. So, to have a longer day, you'd wear the wetsuit so you didn't get wet. So, that's something that he brought over from uh, the West Coast days when he was out there. And then he would wear um, Dale, um, these boots, or duck boots. So, there's kind of these rubber boots that hunters still use today. And then... The, the cutting edge was having the fast X clips. I'm sure you've seen the Sims 1500 with the fast X clips with no high back. Like that's what he had. But in that photo, there was a board and there's, there's a whole other story with that board too. Is like it had steel edges. And so it was maybe three of those boards in the, in the United States at that time. Excuse me. And then I think there was a group up in, um, I want to say Ontario that was doing it. Maybe there was a gal that was doing it for K2 skis. And so they kind of, they kind of figured out how to put steel edges on snowboards. That was like, somebody had to figure that out. You all take it for granted as you go ripping down the hill and stand in line and bitch that there's so many people in the line, but there was somebody had to figure something out in order for these dominoes to fall for us to all enjoy our, uh, our winter exca- escapades. So yeah, he had, he had that board and I don't know where it's at today, but that's where it happened. I can just imagine you guys out there in the cold without the gear that we all have today that we take for granted. <laughs> the wetsuit. Yeah, the wetsuit that's wet out of control. Yeah, the wetsuit and then, yeah, just a windbreaker. But he had a just out there freezing, the yep. but having so much fun that <clears throat> yeah, you're making just, it happen. Yeah, you're just 
Yeah. And then I think the other one was like ski areas. I think at the time, by 85, maybe there's eight resorts. So again, shout outs, give a horn here to Jake Burton and his lawyers for working with the insurance companies and, you know, getting by that obstacle of like, hey, it doesn't have a break and it's not safe. It's not a directional, it's not directional tool, whatever. And Jake actually yeah, met he, with lawyers and made that oh, happen. Yeah, he was part of that because, uh, you know, that was part of, you know, what Burton was working on is trying to, he saw the vision of getting it onto the slopes. And Stratton was one of the early adopters in allowing it. And so they, I think because they were early, you know, that, that they're real loyal on the back, on the east side. And they'll continue to come to your mountain. So thank you for getting that done because if we, if we didn't get on the hill, we wouldn't be sitting here today, that's for sure. Yeah. All the cool stuff you got in here. But yeah. yeah, I remember we used to have to get the uh, certification to go on the resort and all that. You had to, like, <laughs> go up with a pro and they would deem you certified or safe enough for the mountain. Yeah. Mark Charge Heingartner. you a little extra. <laughs> yeah, Mark Heingartner certified me. I ended up being one of those guys. Um, it was my one of my first, I guess, professional snowboard gigs was a snowboard instructor. I had a little badge and everything. <laughs> <laughs> what but, mountain was that at? Toggenberg. Shouts out, give him a horn. <laughs> they went down in flames. Um, four hundred vertical, baby. And that's where that's where I learned. I was flipping burgers to get a season pass and then um, taking those burgers out of the freezer and living on them. But yeah, the, um, I think that's the one spot I, I tried it. It was like minus 20 below zero. It gets, it gets chapped out there. And I wanted to see what would happen. My board literally would not move. And I had to walk down the hill. First and only time I had to walk down the hill because it just did not work. And it hurt to, um, to be in that icy condition. But yeah, you gotta try. It's a story for you guys today at my expense. <laughs> Amazing. Well, we happen to have a guest question from none other than Todd Richards. Here we go. What's up, boys? Todd Richards here with a question for, actually a question and a statement for one of my, my best buddies in snowboarding, Mr. Trevor Graves. So I guess the statement is, is that Trevor, I tell you this all the time, and I'm going to tell you again, you have done so much for my career in the past, kickstarting me, even getting sponsored to pointing the very first camera at me in snowboarding that anyone ever did, getting me my first photo in the magazine, blah, 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 blah. I guess basically what I want to say to you is, is thank you so, so much without you being on the East coast for us and for me in particular, I don't think a lot of us would have gotten anywhere in snowboarding. So for that, I am eternally grateful. And I guess here is the question part is that you kind of pioneered a whole bunch of different styles of shooting snowboarding uh, back when it was really do it yourself. And there wasn't so many filters and easy ways to get up on the hill and be creative. Can you talk a little bit about the creative process um, that you used to bring into snowboarding, whether it be lugging generators up or crazy ideas that you had that you basically would just force us all into doing back east that would make incredible photos and then maybe just elaborate on on some of the some of the ideas that maybe went south that weren't really <laughs> weren't really so hot so anyways um trevor i'm so glad that you're doing the bomb hole and then i highly suggest that that everyone out there really do a deep dive on some trevor graves images on the web because he has shot some of the most iconic snowboarding photos of all time. So all hail Trevor Graves. See you guys. I'm not worthy. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Todd. <clears throat> yeah, you never know what you never know what the interactions in your life are gonna bring and you cross paths with people and then one thing leads to another to another and to another. Um but yeah, shouts out to Todd because he worked hard in the back east days as well i mean he was going to college uh getting a graphic i think it was a graphic design uh degree and then he would drive his butt up to vermont to do the new england cup series uh, on the weekends and so he would you know go back and forth back and forth in the meantime like jason uh, noah brandon rob levine and those guys had the habit trail house and so they kind of could train all day and and would be better at it and then the pipes were starting to happen, so he definitely had his skateboard style that he'd bring. Uh, it really kind of advanced all of us because uh, you could see how you could do it. So you got skiers kind of coming into snowboarding, and then the skateboarders kind of coming into snowboarding, and then the, I think it's the mesh for us on the East Coast um, that really kind of made the magic. And it's, it's, it's that crew, too. They all had this 
vision and dream of really making careers for themselves as pro snowboarders. And so they would dedicate their time and energy to trying to do my ideas. It's like, <clears throat> cause that's the only thing we had like to get out to the West coast. If we weren't, you know, representing in the West coast pubs and you couldn't really have a snowboard career. So they all got it and they all would work really, really, really hard. And I'd have to say today too, and any East coast are coming West. It's like, they learn how to edge and it's such an advantage when you get out here. It's so much more fun. You go to some place like Mammoth, you know, it could be a bad day for everybody else. But, man, carving, carving's really fun. Carving Killington, carving snow. It's really fun. So, anywho, the um, I think what the other thing that Todd's alluding at, again, is like, how do you make something different? And then, you know, when you're going through it, you're not really going, oh, hey, I'm going to be the next Andy Warhol or something. But you're, like, working hard to get something different that's not being produced by, you know, Bud Fawcett or John Foster, Guy Mutel. Um, Cause you know, to be honest, it's like, it's competitive. It's like John Foster sitting at trans world office. He's going to edit his stuff cause he's got a story behind it. And so there was always, he always felt dissed or slighted because you're on the East coast because they were right there and they, they had the magazine that was their, 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 their playground. So you had to have something that was going to be just so powerful that they're going to, they can't say no, they're going to do it. And then what he alluded at was the uh, generator shoot. So we do night shoots. And and we're probably looking at probably 1990 right now. Stratton's pipe was starting to get uh, famous. Brushy had done the world tour and gotten a lot of championships and got me on the map. I was getting calls and faxes from Germany and Japan to get Jeff Brushy pictures because nobody knew who this kid was. And he shows up and he's ripping and he's got style and, and – um, Jeff was really kind of helping us grow um, and getting our scene kind of noticed there <clears throat> at Stratton. And then I did, um, I'm a skateboarder, really kind of growing up as a skateboarder, and you're looking at what Grant Britton's doing with flashes. So I'm like, how do I do this? So in the interaction of all this, I'm living in Syracuse. I would drive eight hours to Plymouth State and stay with Eric Webster at the university, show up at two after the party and sleep in all the beer and in my sleeping bag, I had this sleeping bag. It was my home. And then um, do the contests on the weekend. I'd shoot pictures, sell them to the kids um, the next weekend for five bucks to get gas money to get back and forth because eight hours, New York State through it, you got to pay, blah, blah, blah. But, and that's how I kind of kept it going. I was professional. Um, but that was it. And then I took a job. Actually, it was great. My, my, um, John, my boss in Syracuse, said, hey, there's this job in Albany, New York, which now would mean it's only a two-hour drive to Stratton. But it's second shift. I go, it's even better. So he actually called that guy at General Electric's and got me the job. And so the job was second shift running E6 machine. So for all those back in the day, that's the chemical process for running a slide film. Slide film is what you would use to publish in the magazines and – there was definitely, um, you know, there's why there was professionals. You had a third of a stop increment where digital today, it's like you can chip the heck out of it. Like, all right, I'll just in Photoshop. It's, it's easy. You know, I have, I have respect for it, but at the same time, it's like, I'm done. Like anybody can shoot now. It's you over. can totally blow a photo <laughs> and so fix easy. it. Myself Photoshop. included, right? You yeah. can fix stuff. You shoot with a cell phone. You're going to publish a poster or a billboard with it, right? Gary Land's doing billboards now with iPhone photos, right? So it's um so it was there was definitely, you know, we'll call it creative and science to be able to get to be good. And then you had to focus. So there's a whole bunch of other things that had to happen. But we did these night shoots and it was definitely skateboard inspired by Grant Britton, no question. And I was working with this guy, Greg Bertolini. He was um schooled, he was a Navy shooter, and then he was schooled at RIT, which in that time was next to Kodak, which is one of the biggest photo schools in the world. And he was one of the brainiacs that came out of there and he was my mentor. So I'd ask him questions. You didn't have the internet. How do you do this? Oh, that's synchro son. This is how you do it. And he knew technically how to explain it to me. And then I'm like, Oh, all right. And then you'd save your money and then you start to build, you know, the equipment list. And that was, I had a Novatron 400 um, flash kit, but you didn't have batteries back then. They weren't invented yet. And I'd have to bring up this 2,000 watt generator. So now you see, I'm, I'm literally put this thing in my trunk of my 77 Chrysler LeBaron, and then this flash thing, and then you go up to the hill. And then what they had was this little Polaroid dealie on the back. 
And that was the, that was the key to learning is like I could shoot a Polaroid in the snow, put it under my armpit. Cause now it's Stratton. It's nighttime. It's seven at night. And you're like, it's freezing. You had to keep it 70 degrees to get the, get the chemicals to work. And then you could see, you know, literally within a minute, whether I was on or off. And that's how I was learning how to shoot the exposure because you didn't want these guys hiking up and down, wasting their energy. You wanted to be on because if you suck, they're not going to want to shoot with you. So I had to keep earning it. Um, that trick helped a thousand percent. Then I could shoot the film, take it back down to General Electric's, process it, see it, and then make my next adjustment for the weekend after. But it was getting the generator up. What was fun is at first I would take it up in a sled and, and getting permission from Stratton too because, again, liabilities – was a big deal back then and those guys jp was the general manager and he let me get up there um <clears throat> you just, yeah okay you just turn the other way and let me do it and then lyle and i'm sure hopefully he'll be mentioned in somebody else's uh, stories about stratton's pipe you know just a dude that's running heavy equipment made us big big old trannies and he would clean it for us before we'd go out so everybody was celebrating this thing and anybody who was a rookie so I remember like, uh, it's probably like Seth and Seth and even Russell. It's like, yo, you got to carry the generator up if you want to shoot tonight. <laughs> Pay your dues, go. Seth Miller and Seth Neary. Yeah, I probably made them push it up there. And then you name you name it, all the kids from the East Coast came through at some point in time and got in on a night shoot. And then again, it's like, you know, I had 36 exposures. I didn't have a ton of money. I had to pick and choose. I always felt like a dick because it's like I didn't shoot everybody, to be honest. Like, we probably not going to get published. Your style's kind of whack, so I'm not going to shoot you today. So and they I, know if the flash is popping or not, huh? Oh, yeah, you can, you can <laughs> totally tell. So it's like <clears throat> you get them you get them going, and then, um, you know, then it was like during the U.S. Open, it's like when the guys would all come into town, like Craig Kelly specifically, you know, it's like, okay, Craig, and he would show up prepped and ready. And so there's another shot. I don't know if I bring it today, but Craig literally wore the Oakleys. Like the dude knew what to do. He's wearing Oakleys at night, you know? Because he knew what was going on, and then I had the um, embrushy we and I shared earlier. Is like we changed up clothing, so we learned that if we wore lighter clothing, yellows and oranges and reds, then the photos would pop better, and we had better potential to get in the cover. Because that was always my goal: was get the cover, get the big bucks, and then be able to get the next lens for the camera quiver. Do you remember what they paid for a cover back then? <clears throat> 800 bucks, I think. It never actually changed very much. Really? Oh, that's so sad, man. All this inflation. I think it went same. up to like 1000 Oh, no. I'm glad I got out. No. So I can't believe you had to bring a generator to make your flash work. Yeah, there was like, well, again, to get the most, that much power. Yeah, um, and now they just have a battery pack that oh, yeah, clips like, right on. Yeah. It's a whole different world. I mean, you were getting faxes from overseas to buy photos. Faxes at 2 in the morning and then. <laughs> Your girlfriend, you wake up because you're excited, and you know there's there's probably a paycheck or yeah, something. Yeah, you're like, there. I just you're saw like, the photo. Oh, I'm going to go look at that fax. And it was that long <laughs> paper. It wasn't like a, yeah, it was, it was. I don't know how we got things done back then. Yeah, it's so crazy. And now <laughs> it just moves at the the lightning fast speed with the internet the way it is. It's just a different time. Yeah, it's so silly, right? And then, yeah, that's what Todd was talking about with the, with the night shoots and something I feel, you know, I feel very proud of that work and, that's when you got that up. brushy shot. Oh yeah, brushy was like, brushy was the king, dude. Like, he'd come in and he just, he'd literally look at me and poke, and it was like, it felt like five seconds. He's standing in the air, just looking at me. Boop, pop. Okay, you get it. And I, next, the dude was on it, and then we we coordinate the tricks and figure out what we wanted to shoot. But um, we talked earlier how he had those double tongue boots, and that's how right? he was getting those crazy tweaks. Huh? Yeah, you had some of something to say about that. Yeah, it was just it was blowing away how uh, I remember when Burton came out with them. And uh, I actually had a pair. They didn't last very long, but it's just crazy how that equipment would allow him. I mean, he's actually double jointed, I remember, too, so he could poke a little more than everyone else. But it would allow him to uh, get those kind of tweaks that people just can't get today. Style. style, And he had just the best style. I mean, I remember looking at that photo when I was a kid, and that's kind of what inspired me to. Last to, year? Yeah, last year, yeah, I wish. <laughs> uh, Ninety-seven years ago, actually, yeah, more like one hundred and sixty years ago. But inspired me to uh, pursue snowboarding. You know, you see a shot of Jeff like that; it was just mm -hmm. incredible what it can do to a young kid mm. thank and you. get you just hyped on a sport. So, yeah, thank you for creating those images. That was, yeah, it was fun times. I have a question, particularly about that brushy photo. I want to know: you're in the dark room, you're scrolling through your your film. Mm -hmm. That thing 
come you see that thing mm -hmm. how was that experience you were like this is a banger that word wasn't invented yet yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you felt no. the clip high yeah, that's it's, what we um, call it no it's like when you say it i remember it i actually remember going through it is you get these tingles up your neck because the way it would come off the machines is um you know the film would be rolled you got 36 roll and this is all e6 so it's coming off the end of the machine and then there's a light up at the top and you just kind of do this real quick because you want to get that immediate dopamine hit. Like, oh, dude, am I in or out? Did I Am I going to have to go between my tail between my legs and go back to these guys and say I effed up? Or did I get the goods? Because if I get the goods, I'll come back, right? But you look, 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 and you see it, and you're just like, oh. And then, the, you know, the dopamine, tingle, the dopamine goes up your neck, and you're like, oh, I want this high every single time. And I think that's why I keep doing it. But, yeah, um, thanks for that little buzz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was... Um, I wish I could get like that every day. Get yeah, true. the wheel every day like that. And, then, and, and the then riders get it too when they do the tricks, and it's just a mm – -hmm. I mean, Chris gets it when he gets a video shot. We call oh, it clip yeah. eye. Well, we get it. It, you, it just changes. Clip eye changes. We, we get it at the end of a good podcast. Yeah, true. Okay. It's like, I'm like, yeah. oh, we just back lip to King Crow, you know? <laughs> right, yeah. Now, Something with the creative that does does that naturally, right? So I mentioned the, as you put it, clip high tingle on your neck about getting that that photo mm -hmm. of Jeff Brushy back. Do you want to just walk us through that iconic photo? Jeff Brushy photo. Um, air to fakey, yellow pants, dreadlocks are flying, and he's staring down the barrel of the camera. Uh, the way we do that is I'd bring up a 2,000-watt generator to the side of the pipe, and then I'd have my girlfriend at the time actually hold a 2 by 4 oct um, softbox with the flash inside of it. So the flash, or the, for those that don't know what those boxes do, it kind of makes the light bigger so that um, you wouldn't get any harsh shadows or these little pointy things. And so that was important to me. And then <clears throat> work with Jeff uh, and all the guys that were there, usually take three to five of us so that so the kicker didn't get uh, tracked out too bad. Uh, and then work, and that was it. And everybody, and it was, for that shot, um, Man, that one ended up in an ad for Burton. That was really one of the cool ads that JDK did back then. I thought were really, I thought those are still they still stand up to today's standards. I think, but you tell me. And then, and that really those photos when they started showing up, everybody else wanted to come to these night shoots. And then you kind of had this um, exclusivity club where you got invited or you didn't to get up on the hill. In those days, um, I always felt bad about it. The other one is I always wanted to bring. And share a JPEG if I could or a print. And I just didn't have the budgets to be able to bring them pictures each time so they could put up on the fridge or send to a sponsor. They kind of had to wait for the magazine to show up um, to, get them, to get them out there. How many tries would it take, Jeff, to get a rad shot like that? Would it, is it easy for him? or It's all done in post. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, no, Jeff's pro, dude. Yeah, he I, would just he, nail it. He could nail I mean, obviously, any one of them, especially when you're starting out it's in any, any night session – on the pipe you get used to it you kind of got your get your feet underneath you all the guys and then once you start getting it you get the little rut built and there's this sort of the speeds uh they're they're starting to pick up then they start going higher they got more confidence and then the tricks start to flow and what's great with that arrow isn't about how many spins or i'm going to die with my head landing on the deck it's like just style period it's it's all skate influenced and wanted to make it look so styly so all those guys um, that's what they would bring to the table What's Great. cool is it's kind of come around full circle too, where guys are trying to emulate emulate that oh, photo. Really? Yeah, it's kind of like Sweet. the new style right now, which is rad for the riders because they don't have to do a fourteen forty or some crazy maneuver. They can just focus. But the boots are stiffer now, though, so it's hard to get those tweaks. It's true; they are a lot stiffer. And then, um, yeah, some of the method airs I'm seeing too. Those guys are just boating. Yeah, just oh, no boosting. Sleep. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, even in the pipe. Japanese kid there in the pipe, 20, what, 25 feet out? Like, yeah, that was incredible. Could have never even fathomed the idea of a 25-foot air back in 1990. Yeah, when you were shooting the Stratton pipe, it was just a hand-dug pipe, or like you yeah. were saying, maybe yeah. some heavy equipment. Eight foot out was a big a big night. That was a big air. Yeah, it was big, and then, <laughs> all right, forgive us. It wasn't it wasn't the same standards, but yeah. But it, at the time, imagery it was though amazing. still is better than today's. Yeah, the imagery yeah. still holds up. If I got that photo today, I would yeah. probably retire. 
<laughs> get you stoked to get out and ride. That was the intent all along with that era was just get everybody excited to come out and go snowboarding, period. Yeah, get more people excited, huh? Yeah, because yeah, you were so underrepresented on the ski resort. Um, and then getting more people out, you just felt, yeah, you could feel like that sense of community. That's the other thing I think you all can't feel in today's era is just that feeling of, hey, you got you got a board. We're buddies, and it's instant bros, instant huh? bros. And nowadays, it's like, yo, you're in my way. Stay, you know, yeah, not that same thing. Huh? No, every snowboarder was your friend. <laughs> yeah, I think I had that one day and up at Meadows and was going over shooting star. And I looked down. There's all these borders, and you're like, I took a picture of it actually, and I was like, oh, I was just so bummed because I didn't know <laughs> any one of them, and they don't know me. It's like, it's just like, oh. We're at the mall. It doesn't matter. So, yeah, and back then, everyone knew everyone. Oh, right? Yeah, it was such a great era. And then they'd let you sleep on their couch, and they'd help you anyway, anyway to, to get you on the hill. So, yeah, it was a really good era. I really feel really privileged that I got to experience that. Also, the vibe when people would hike the pipe together. Yep. That was a cool thing we talk about on the show now and again. That is kind of lost now. Yeah, the, um, yeah, the show and just the closeness to the athletes at the U.S. Open, and I'm sure uh, plenty of the guys that you'll talk to will – share that experience it was that was um that was special yeah very special time now i have a question i was talking to todd richards who said that um he would not have a career if you didn't point a camera at him and Mm -hmm. he said the same about potentially brushy Mm -hmm. um but he said i want to just do a little myth busters here he said you had a wardrobe of uh where you only wore three u2 shirts and that was it is that what he's saying? It's probably true. It's like, <laughs> I don't remember what era that was. Well, I got to shoot. I had a girlfriend that had, or before I was doing all this, I, I had a girlfriend that was the uh, fan club president for U2. And so I'd go to Boston and shoot. So Todd would skate and I'd get to shoot him. But then the day before I was shooting Bono. It's like, all right, this is cool. And it was in the Palis- or Palisades Theater. It was really small, small venue, maybe even as big as this place. And then you're there with Bono. And it's like, oh, wow, I'm going places. And so I got that. Again, it's a game of who you know, period. Everything in life, it's a game of who you know, right? So I got in and got to do that work. So that's where I got the, the U2 stuff um, from there. I wonder what she's doing today. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And then at some point along those uh, years, you met a young Cole Barish. That guy, he's done all right too. Yeah, he's Give got him a some, little air horn. Yeah, it's, that's when I first got um. You, you know, as a shooter, you get to kind of run the um, you know, the professional circus in the background, but don't have to deal with all the weirdness at the front. So, like Jeff, like for example, Jeff, you go to brush, brush, you go to Japan, and they get swamped. And Jeff's not that guy. He just doesn't doesn't like it so much and he's a little more reserved but as a shooter you didn't have to deal with it but you got all the same perks but you never got recognized you know the little name maybe but then <clears throat> there's like a style issue for snowboarder and then i went to a snow shop uh, up in burlington and then this kid i don't know he's like 14 comes up he goes hey are you trevor graves and I'm like usually people thought it was craig kelly because you're hanging out with brushy and all the other guys but no yeah he goes yeah and the style guide on page 45 there's a black and white picture was that shot with a 25 red filter and i'm like the heck is this kid (laughs) what yeah it is actually and then um cole's career blew you know he flourished from there and then as and that's what i like too about um aging out you know it's like you get your varsity letter and then you got to move out for the next team to kind of come in and take the locker and run the show and you know i had moved out of the east coast and that gave opportunity for the next crew to come through like gary land and um he's got a good one going there and cole and and all those guys uh because you're out of the way (laughs) and they can kind of come in and run the show that's great that's the way it should be okay we happen to have a guest question from none other than Cole Barish. Yeah, what up, bomb hole? Cole Barish here. Buds, how are we doing? Grandies, TG, thanks for having me. I have a question for you today. 
As you have a large understanding of business and were a legend photog in the game, I was wondering, what guidance would you give to the young grasshoppers today who are shooting, particularly on how to keep their integrity of their work and push their progression of the craft while still having to feed the machine, machine of the internet? Thank you and hope y'all have a good one. Great question, Cole. And I wouldn't expect anything less from you. So I appreciate it. And congratulations on your career and all of the amazing things. And a bigger shout out to being a new family man and, and owning that job and category. Congratulations, Cole. Give him some applause for that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's funny because I just literally just jumped on TikTok feed today and it was like, um, the career or the college degrees that pay the least amount and the worst one, guess. Was it photography? Yeah. Imagine really? That. Yeah, the worst career college. <laughs> worst career choice? You can make is as a photographer. No. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we're doomed. So I guess if that's truth, yeah, don't start today. Start something else. And then, you know, he hit on a couple points too. Again, it's like having integrity, feeding the machine, and just keeping a paycheck coming. And there was um, there's one... One sound bite, right? And if I could put a headline up, it's like, if you start shooting weddings during the summer and you want to be a snowboard photographer and you get too good at shooting the weddings, guess what? You're a wedding photographer now. Congratulations. <laughs> Careful what you choose as uh, your subject matter. Um, so again, creatively, I can shoot whatever I want. I don't necessarily share it and post it. I will shoot a wedding for a friend if they need help. And I want to do that as part of my gift to them and celebrating their, their wedding. But you will not find me shooting, uh, unless I absolutely necessarily have to. And I did do two admittedly back in the day when I was in Syracuse to get the check. Um, but I knew what I was doing. It was a strategy on my part knowing, okay, I got the skill. I just need the money. So I'll take it. <clears throat> um, and that was probably some sound advice from uh, Greg Bertolini back in the day when I was working at GE. And then if you, um, the other one is like, why am I going to hire you today? So again, have a subject matter expertise and iPhones count on today's platform. So I look at like, you know, having your Instagram feed fed um, because that's where I probably, you know, I look at where our creative teams at Nemo, find inspiration is it's through those Instagram feeds and they're going to find somebody and they're going to want to introduce them when the project's right um, to, to the, to one of our clients. And so, and they're going to get the confidence based on what they're seeing on your Instagram feed. So that's part of your marketing tool. So you got to feed that thing and then think about it strategically and not um, as an afterthought, like, Oh, I got to put something up today. Be purposeful on what you're putting up there and have a reason and a rationale and there's plenty of, um, you know, because best practices for Instagram marketing, they pertain to photography as well. It's not like you're just putting a nice picture up every day, but um, there's other things that you can share that show the personality of who you are and why you would bring you to bring you to the to the shoot professionally. Another one is like, <clears throat> why am I going to pick your photo, right? Like again, area, subject area matter matters. I think about when I was working with Mastercraft at one of our Nemo clients, there was a young shooter out of Florida um, that had a zine. Uh, his name's Josh Letchworth. And actually, we're working with him today here for North Face. Dude rips. He's amazing. And I talked the client into working with him. They didn't want to hire him because uh, they wanted to shoot with car, big fancy car shooters. Like, I go, no, dude, this kid's the goods. And he had water housing experience. But he doesn't really have water housing experience. What he does is he literally makes the chest protector a diaper and floats with a 35 mil rig at water level. So if he goes over, the whole rig's done. Damn. And he's that good and confident that he can pull that off. And that's just part of what he can do that everybody else can't do, that we hire him and pay him too much money. I mean, a lot of money. To do it. <laughs> and I enjoy every dollar he's been with this guy. So I just joke because we're good buddies that way. And a um why doesn't he just use water housing? I don't know. I think it's just the way it focuses for him, just the way he feels. Because yeah, again, when he was learning too, it didn't have autofocus, but there's a couple guys in, in my career back before autofocus. It was like Vianney Tuso was a fucking wizard with with the autofo with manual focusing. Yeah. 
And then um, this guy, Josh, in the water was able to manu- just manually autofocus. It was that quick. He was that good at it. So shout out to having that manual skill. It's like an athletic gift uh, to be able to manually focus that well. And then you're saving film, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, so he had something unique and different. He, he's a water expert, surf expert kind of guy. Um, like Matty Good, Matty Goodman, um, water guy, gets in the surf, gets it done. Ever try shooting in the surf? It's a little bit, like once or twice, just from the beach, not in the water. Dude, I got humbled. Really? <sighs> you suck. just get, you were out in the water? Oh, I had a little Iconis and is with um, Jeff Hurley, Dave Downing, and Jamie Lynn at um, Mimotu in Tavarua. And I got in the water, oh, I'm going to do this and get in and set the barrel i'm in there i'm shooting put my hand through him dude i'm don king he was the guy back in the day this polo player that would just tread water for hours and then i got worked by the waves (laughs) dude i just ended up in the washing machine i went down the camera got loose i'm just into the reef i'm just i just got dave downing saved me thank you dave (laughs) i was oh a lot harder than you wearing flippers too no, it's just um, I had a little floaty thing on, but man, it didn't help me, and I just got work. So. Yeah, I think you have to have flippers, right? And the in the bigger stuff, yeah, I the wasn't, stuff. I wasn't allowed to go to cloud break. Yeah, I shot the I shot on the scaffolding cloud break, but that's a whole other story. But it was fun to be able to go into that world for a little bit and have a better appreciation for the sport for and, the people that actually oh, do it full time. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to stand on the beach and look good, but then yeah, big lens. But man, getting in the water. No joke. I'm huh? not worthy. They are just a whole other breed. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I have a big shark phobia, so I couldn't hang out all day in the water like that. Right? I you'd, just feel like bait. You'd be more likely to die from a mosquito bite than a shark is bite. That, is that the deal? Statistically <laughs> true. Yeah. Still, Jaws, it did it for me. So going back to uh, Cole's question, though, you know, advice for a young grasshopper, I'm, I'm going to highlight something that you said earlier that I thought was great advice in regards to shooting with you, too. You're like, it's all who you know. Is yeah, the who you know statement again that is um so critical. It's all networking. I have my kids now are young adults, and it's just something I'm pounding to them every minute I get. It's like my daughter Aiden's working for me at the Nemo shop right now, and it's like she's kind of shy. And it's like, hey, we're having a lunch, a barbecue, meet these people because they will help you get to the next spot. And it, and it is so true because, um, you know, I think about the the, the thing is, like, I met Scott Clum at college, who hung out with Tom Sims, who introduced me to Tom Shea at International Snowboard Magazine, who got me my first published photos that introduced my name to the world and then started, you know, all the feed, you know, that introduced me to Brushy, you know, next thing, next thing, next thing. Um, and as Todd had said as earlier, too, is, like, we had that connection, we knew each other, and then one thing leads to another, and even today, we'll still. I gave him. I gave him a shout, and he need. Hey, I need to get an SUV down in San Diego. Help me out. Like, it's somebody I knew in San Diego. Happened to be Todd Richards, but it's like, hey, it's in my quiver. I'll use him. To come on, help me out, because he wants to help out. Because we all. That's what you do. Um, so yeah, it's a, it did. So you don't need a college education. It's a game of who you know. So be a good networker. Yeah, I've heard even in college, it all just comes down to who you met in college Holy. and partied with, and those are the people that get mm-hmm. you the jobs. That's the scary thing with the you know with COVID and everybody getting locked down. It's like colleges, you don't. It is all the people that you meet at school, and I think right now what I'm feeling, I don't really, I'm really blessed at Nemo where, you know, everybody wants to do work remotely and they feel they got a new benefit, but I think they're actually shooting themselves in the foot by not having the employer to have a central place to come and meet and collaborate and share ideas with you know hey if you just want to be you know hey i'm a telemarketer cool do that from your house and kitchen awesome there's a new world that's just opened up to you great awesome take advantage of it but man i notice it's our young employees that want to get into the shop to mentor with our senior people to learn the gift and the craft and it isn't happening on zoom it's happening live in the room when you get to sit with a mentor and watch them live um, and how they're going to do and handle the challenges because creativity is different every day for us. Our clients make us think differently every single day. This is not a factory with creativity. You can't just pump it out one after the other. Um, you you got to reinvent the wheel every day, and that's the gift of it. You have to have a new campaign every time you sit down with a new client, right? You can't just mm-hmm. go back to with the old idea. Every day. And in the office yep. here, we see the same thing. You know, when you get together, that's when the ideas start formulating better, you know? Hell yeah. Spitballing ideas. And, and I commend you for making it, you know, in this 
is part of the brand of the bomb hole and is getting here and physically and watching you guys. I'm reading you and, and feeling this energy and it makes me want to uh, participate, but we could have done this on zoom. hundred percent. But it's same. not yeah, it the, same have been the same conversation, it's not right? the same product. And so congratulations for making that uh, commitment, you know, to keeping this whole thing going the way your vision of making it come to be. Cause I think it's right. This is awesome. Awesome. Thank you. It's fun. It's fun. We, we're uh, lucky to have conversations, but like you were saying earlier, the one thing that's great about having everybody together is you, you yell across to the desk next to you, hey, what do you think about this? Or changes. Somebody's mm-hmm. graphic design in a T-shirt, and instead of going back and forth on mm-hmm. five emails, you can say, well, I don't like this. You should try this color. Come back in in two seconds. Actually, try this color and this color. Okay, boom, we got it. That would have taken five days of yep. emails. Yep. Right? Totally. And um, you get it. It's like, you, like I say, I think the younger generation gets it better as I didn't think they would, to be honest, in the seat that I sit in some days, and they didn't think they'd get it, but they do. And so congratulations. Yeah, back to it's a game of who you know and stay networking. Um, Were you kind of the person that pushed Cole, like, to get him <coughs> starting to get published and all that? Not at all. No. Um, I think even Cole will probably give other props out to other shooters that gave him other opportunities because John Foster was sitting in a great seat that could help. Um, East Coast was wide open. Kid's talented. He definitely had um, – a unique look, an editorial kind of look to what he was shooting that was different than what I was doing and anybody else at that time. And so he earned it straight up. Well, I want want to change gears into the migration from East Coast to Oregon and how, what that looked like. So the migration from moving from, at this time I lived in Albany, New York to Salem, Oregon. Um, And thinking about the West Coast as a strategic move for my photography career, I think the fun one is I did a I talk, Doug Palladini at Snowboarder Magazine to paying me to do an article called In Search of Bigfoot. And that was the premise of it. I took all my buddies and we went and I just basically shopped places I want to live <laughs> in the guise of, we're looking for Bigfoot, <laughs> but pay me anyway. We'll write a story. Did you find Bigfoot? Of course. Of course. Yeah, there's photo <laughs> evidence. I got photo evidence. Um, but yeah, I ended up hooking up with Mike Estes in Oregon. I brought Jeff, uh, I mean, uh, Chris Swires. He's got a cool place down in um, Mexico now. You should check it out. I think he just opened up. Congratulations, Chris. And then Steve Blakely, the original vegan um, out of Rochester. So we all toured the Northwest. So I went to Timberline Lodge. I went to Crystal Mountain, Baker. Um, So on my list was like Truckee, uh, Portland, Seattle, San Francisco. That was sort of my, my short list of cities. I didn't really know what I didn't know. Ended up falling in love with uh, Portland, Oregon, even in the rain that we had on that shoot. And, um, you know, at that time you could see Nirvana for four bucks at La Luna. So it was a special time back then. Four dollars to see Nirvana, wow. Four bucks. Yeah, one of the guys works for me, Mark, got to see Nirvana for cheap. But And then he, um, so we got in to Portland. So what I ended up doing is um, my wife at the time was repping for uh, Morrow snowboards with Brad Stewart. So Rob Morrow and Brad Stewart kicked out of Sims with uh, Mickey Keller and Scott, and they started Morrow snowboards in Salem, Oregon. That's where Rob Morrow's from. Another guy would be great for the show too. He's really fun, fun character. And he was, she was East Coast rep, so we were turning screws at demos, etc. Had a little little van, and he said, "Hey, you want to come out and work in the marketing department here in Salem?" Yeah, let's do it. Five hundred bucks. We started our journey. Got to the the middle section or what do they call it tornado alley or whatever watch that whole thing go down and had to hide under the bridge and this is when there was pay phones and click click hey brad i think we're in the middle of the country we're in the middle of the country we're on our way he goes oh i won't be here when you get here i'm starting a new company called bonfire oh damn <laughs> like <laughs> oh okay because the whole premise was working with brad stewart um and being mentoring with brad and, and learning the ropes because he was he was well uh, well ahead of where I was at with the whole uh, industry. And then, you know, good thing, bad thing, who knows is what it is. But we got to port, we got to Salem and I ended up living in Rob Morrow's mom's house for six months or so um, in order until we found a place to live uh, in Salem, Oregon. So that's where I started uh, on the, on the West coast. And then my business quadrupled because now you're closer to Tahoe. You're just a driver of quick flight, you know, air, get in, get to Asia, even New Zealand trips were happening because it's a lot quicker flight, not that 20, whatever, nine hours is quick, but 
you could get in and out. Um, and then Mount Hood, obviously. So I could always be pulling shoots all summer long in August because I was I had a monopoly on snow. So it was definitely a business strategy and a, an emotional strategy. I still feel my soul was meant to be. I thought I'd live in California as a kid skateboarding at 12 years old, but, you know, Portland worked out as a better home for me, and that's home today. Amazing. Now, around that time, I know that uh, Craig Kelly flew you out to Rick Scranton. I want to hear the story behind that. You did your homework. Yeah. Craig Kelly is um, the utmost professional. And I'm sure many guests have shared that story about Craig. Um, but what Craig, Craig, smart guy, what they were doing is they get photo incentives. <clears throat> and so he wanted to make sure he was getting the most dollar return on his time. And I'm looking at it a little bit from my seat now as, you know, a business person and and looking back at what we're doing as these young men and he, he didn't, um, he knew like if I get Trevor to come and shoot this camp I'm doing in Rick's grants. And, and again, that at the time was a a pinnacle place to go. It wasn't what it was after um, the big air, but he started it. So I went, I did a story and the premise was I'd publish stories and I pre-sold it to German, German magazine, Japanese backside monster backside. And then, um, so there's no exclusives for anybody, but I had to shoot a ton of pictures because at the time you didn't have digital or you can just send everybody the same JPEGs. It's like you had to come up with enough good a shots on film in order to be able to populate these stories and get them out there. And so Craig could know that whatever he would spend getting me there would be a quadruple in return on his bottom line as a business. So I think he spent 1500 bucks to get me there. Uh, that was my first helicopter flight. Side story. You know, light meters. Okay, I'm just checking. <laughs> and that was your guide. And it's midnight sun. So if you ever experience it, I say put it on your bucket list. It's an amazing, crazy experience to feel, you know, sunrise at 3 in the morning. And then you get that golden light now for three hours instead of 20 minutes. Like, oh, it's magic. Get in a helicopter, crazy, angry pilot he's all yelling at you and swedish and and then the poop there goes the light meter i didn't see it and as i'm pulling away and i'm feeling that lift you all been in hell it's like you get that that lift there's this crazy whoa the energy i look there's my light meter on the deck and i'm like oh no, no. <laughs> i'm in the biggest shoot of my life at this point and i don't have my light meter so i had to you know use use my common sense to kind of get through my exposures and as a professional i nailed it <laughs> 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 yeah. nice work <laughs> Sometimes um, you just gotta let your retina do the little that, light readings, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was a little trick for you, like you measure off your hand. Sioni was there too, actually. Dave Sioni, that guy, he's so he's such a good travel partner. I think I've been around the roll with that guy three or four times now. Um, but yeah, just meter off your hand, and then you lock it down manually, and then you kind of get your exposure, and then, um, you know, cross your fingers. But yeah, yeah, because it wasn't full sun. The sun kind of just skirts. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's a sunset, like you were saying, mm-hmm. for three hours. It kind of never goes fully up. So yeah, you weren't five six at one hundred or whatever it used to be. Yeah, cheat 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 with film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it uh, it was. Yeah, I figured it out, and then um, and then Craig. Yeah, that was just part of the legacy of what Craig would contribute to others. Again, and again, it's teaching others. Jason Ford and and onward and as a mentor, he would kind of coach the rest of the folks. And it, it eventually gets all the way up to the folks here in town, too, like JP and all those guys feel the halo of what Craig was able to help um, establish for the rest to follow. I'm surprised he didn't have Burton fly you out, too. He just made the decision to he just did do it, it himself, huh? Yeah, he just did it. Like, that's the way Craig, you know, he did True professional. Yeah, he's a pro. Smart, and witty, um, Knowing you'd get it out to different markets, too, like that. That's awesome. The German, the Japanese. Yep. So I guess I work for Craig Kelly. That's cool. I don't put that on my resume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's the top of the resume. Yeah. Yeah, top. Now, Buds, you know what time it is? Oh, name that video part. Oh, no. <laughs> name that video part is uh, presented by our Patreon because our Patreon kicks ass. So thank you guys for supporting us. Um, how are you feeling, Trevor? Feeling good. You guys make it energy in here awesome. And <laughs> it's like, uh, it's funny. I work on so many videos as the still guy. But again, it's like, I don't sit and watch and consume them. I was living them. So it's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. I'll go, next. <laughs> <laughs> True. So 
hopefully you go easy on me. So again, I think I worked on a lot of the fall line flicks. I worked on a lot of robot food um, back in the day, some standard stuff, hatchet time with Mike Hatchet. But yeah, let's see what you throw at me. Maybe it can help. Okay, here we go. Yeah, that's a robot food for sure. <laughs> now, which one? Second one. Yes, it's the second one. Yep, I don't remember which rider's part. It's at the end. Yep. <laughs> it's at the Is end. It's at the credits. Right before. Yep. I didn't do too bad. I think you that, did great. Yeah, I think that's I, I'm going to keep coaching you, though. I want you to get the rider. Last rider is probably Billy Loma. After no. that. Um, Backside you, Rodeo 1080. You see? No. no. It, it's uh, Travis Parker. Oh, Travis Parker. Now, what you did is I'm going to give you that because you got robot food. You got yourself a Yeti bomb hole carry-all. And it. uh, it's filled with bomb hole merch. You got a large bomb hole oh, hoodie. Sweet. You got, uh, I don't know. I don't know what's in there. Jules packed it. I think you got a bomb hole mug. Oh, wow. It's branded. Um, we just <laughs> we slap some, we just slap uh, patches on there, but it's a Yeti. So thank you. Thank you to the folks at Yeti, too, for hooking those up. Yeah. Appreciate it. If you're looking to go to the beach and you want to carry a bunch of shit with you. Those are coolers, too. I don't know if those ones are coolers. Well, I think those like are the carry, all, carry-alls. It's so thick. It's, yeah. It's do you something. could probably put ice in it, but I don't think it's technically a cooler. It's not. Uh, but... That being said, for part two, and name that video part. This one's for our listeners. Uh, so you don't have to answer this one, Trevor. Good luck, team. Um, and if you, for, how do we decide the winner, buds? You got to go to the Instagram, and when we post a photo of Trevor, um, that first photo is where you put the answer, and you will win a prize pack. That's absolutely correct. Not the prize pack that Trevor got, but some. Yeah, a bomb hole prize pack. Similar, we'll say. Okay, here we go. I don't okay. got it. Okay, thank you guys for playing. Aim that video part. All right, I think it's a good time to get in to get a guest question from Blue Montgomery. Oh. Trevor Graves, this is Blue Montgomery. You, my friend, are the mellowest of dudes, but you've always been an absolute creative force. You have taken some of the most iconic images in the history of snowboarding. And in my opinion, you belong in the damn Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. In addition to that, you've created an absolute powerhouse in Nemo Design that has contributed to snowboard graphics and images and ad campaigns more than many people listening to this podcast probably realize. Um, But hey, my question for you is, over the years, did you see... Uh, a tipping point for snowboarding. Maybe it was an athlete you were around or a trip you were on or a product that you saw um, that at that moment you you knew, you realized that um, snowboarding was going to be a cultural phenomenon. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and also just know, um, you know what snowboarding means to you now and, and how it fits into your life. So um, tons of respect, as you know. Love you, miss you. Um, hope our paths cross soon. Can't wait to hear your episode. Hey, Blue. Thanks for the kind words. Good people. That guy. Liked his podcast here. He's, yeah, solid. <clears throat> so questions again to recap. Again, lots of uh, what was the tipping point that I saw for snowboarding um, to be big, I guess. And what does snowboarding mean to me today? So I'll start at the beginning. And again, I, I didn't know what the word entrepreneur was when I was coming up the ranks as a kid. And then, but you knew that snowboarding was going to be big. So I always thought skateboarding was bigger than probably what it really was. And I always knew that if I could be at the beginning of snowboarding and ride the wave, that I'd be able to make a living and I wouldn't have to work at the factory. Because we've all had those shitty jobs. That's a whole other question that we can have it another time. But yes, I didn't want to end up in those jobs. Um, and so I really wanted to make, make a run at it. And I think that I can't, you know, I'm not going to say like, Oh, the high back binding was invented. It was more just the whole, just this whole snowball was just moving. And for me, it was just that crew with, um, you know, with brushy and, and those guys, Jason Ford, Noah Brandon coming up out of the East coast, knowing that there was going to be something bigger that would be able to support me once it grew big enough. I knew it needed magazines. Um, in order to get advertisers to kind of grow it, just, 
you know, as rudimentary as my business knowledge was at that time. And once it was there, then it would take care of me. And I think even then it was like, I wanted to be the best snowboard photographer in the world, period. That was the only vision I had probably in 1988. That's all I thought about. Every decision I made was I'm going to be the best. That's it. So every decision, you don't go out to bars, you don't take girls out to dinner, you save the money because you need it for gas. You know, it's like, that's all I wanted to do was be that guy. So good thing, bad thing, who knows? There's probably some sacrifices and experiences along the way that I didn't get to do, but it didn't matter. I wanted to be the best. Um, and then snowboarding today, <clears throat> you know what's great is, uh, I'm sure you can you guys resonate with this, is like not having to snowboard with the ang- on your back. The backpack. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> like our gear was, you know, you had to have a backup body, you know, all the gear, F5s. Nike had batteries, you had to have extra, you had an extra body in case it goes down, because if you'd shot at Baker for one stormy weekend, that body was for sure going to break right when it wasn't convenient because it got moisture in it. So you'd always have to run with two or three bodies in that bag. And, um, you know, I pack, I don't know about you guys, I was running probably 35 pounds. And um, if I had the Misty Cam, at another 10. Uh, and if you're shooting with any of the big strobes, because uh, th- those things were massive and so if you get a stroby one i call them stroby one kenobis that nice solid name that's a great name you know what i'm saying a grip yo (laughs) you want to earn some earn some free money let's go you're carrying this heavy thing because i can't do it all um so it's right hey we're just running without that but i think it's the um you know the social impact that everybody experiences it's like getting out with nature commuting having um, these memorable moments with your friends and family as you get to go and experience mother nature that way. And then it is still lust for those powder turns. And, you know, Japanese have like a thousand words for snow. And in America, we don't have a word for that feeling in powder turns. I don't, I can look at you guys and you all know what it feels like. And, you know, powder turn, that feeling, there should be a special word for that feeling of weightlessness and freedom that you feel when you nail a really sweet turn. And there isn't, but... We all know. We'll just leave it at that. Um, but again, days on snow probably is way less. I think when I was shooting, I'd average about 180 days on snow in my prime years. And then probably today, if I get 10 good days with friends, that's good enough. That's fine. Uh, and I'm picky. I'm choosy. In the Northwest, I'll hunt the weather down. It's great with the weather apps we have now. We didn't have that. I remember spending $1,000 to get a weather forecast for big shoots. You pay. And I'm like, now it's on my phone. Like, God so good now um and just get the pow and be snobby about it most of my snowboarding's in march in oregon um the most of this you know cruise the vacation people weekend warriors have gone on to other things and it's a lot easier to get on the lift as many i just don't appreciate standing in line all day and getting four rides like it's kind of a bummer but um yeah and i've been spoiled i've had some of the most magical snowboarding experiences and it's hard to I try to forget about them and just have be in that moment, enjoy what I'm doing with the friends that I'm with. I think for political correctness, we have to say angry little person on your back. And then one more question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we'll edit that out. Sorry, guys. <laughs> for one more question, what's the Misty Cam? Misty Cam. Yes, the Misty Cam. Oh. I feel like Brushy might have named that or something. Misty it was does. A, it sounds a popular like a Russell. name going on. Or maybe Russell, it's yeah. A Russell, it's a Russell word for sure. He had all the Libble D and yes. Snap. <laughs> All these crazy words that <laughs> Russell would come up with, and I'm like, man, I feel old. <laughs> but thanks. Uh, Misty Camp, they got, and I think it's branding 101, right? For my brand is having something unique and different to offer. And again, that's what Todd was talking about, is when I had to work with that thing, it was a pain for the rider. They had to hit the mark. They had to hit the trick and be on it, because otherwise it's like, nope, go again, because the focus is, is really difficult. So the backstory on the Misty Cam was, uh, I was really inspired by an artisan called Matt Maherin. And you might have seen some of his Metallica videos. Um, Unforgiven is one that he did. And it's just really grainy. Um, even the new Batman, you know, I think if the film quality there, it's just not everything sharp and focused at, you know, F22. It's like, oh, I like F1.8. And there's this real select focus thing that just creatively was more inspirational for me. And I wanted to bring that to life for our industry and be unique and different, edgy that way. <clears throat> and um, so I ended up engineering a camera. So again, 
back to one of my mentors, Greg Bertolini, at the at, during the GE days, kind of helped me figure out what to do. Because today you have a filter in Photoshop. Yeah. Click. Dude, I'm an artist. <laughs> Look at me go. Like, you know, come on, dude. So the Misty Cam, you had to engineer the thing. So literally what it is, here's the secret, secret ingredients. I'll have to kill everybody after we get done with this call because <laughs> nobody should know what this is. And if you want to go forward and do it, good luck. It's a lot of work. But you tend up taking a Cinar 4x5 camera. So it's a bellows camera that's usually used for architecture. And then I'd engineer, you get the um, 2X converter. And then I mounted that onto the, one of the boards on the Cinar back. And then I had a, I see a Hasselblad behind you there. And it was a 2000 FC. So the Hasselblad made that camera for maybe three years. So with Hasselblads are all leaf shutter. And this one is actually a focal plane shutter by Hasselblad. So it's not as desirable. It's a little clunkier. But for this project, it worked perfectly. And then I mounted that on the back. And then you had to focus. So then I had to get the, the focus deal. And then you actually had to do physical math because with the bellows, um, you had to measure it. And then that would tell you how much light is losing going through the bellows itself. And then you could kind of quickly make a math prediction uh, to get the first exposure. And then I'd add the red 25 filter because you want it to look cool and have that snap to it. And you'd put that in front of the lens and you had to put a lens shade around that because now it's at an angle. So it's going to flare, which could be cool, but it was really quite distracting with this, with this setup. And then put a Polaroid back on the back. And then shoot it, put it under your armpit, warm it up, look at it and see, okay. And then that's when Todd's saying, oh, it didn't work. Go again. And then you had to fix the focus. So it took a ton of work. Uh, I think I sent you a picture down with Natasha Zurich um, and a cheese wedge is yes. what I call that one. Again, it's creatively different. And it's interesting how people had their image, their video image at the time and how many, I'll just leave them nameless that wouldn't take that picture for me. Um, but I carry these Mickey Mouse ears and the Cinar back and a monopod. I used a monopod with that one. And carried it up uh, Valley Nevado in Chile. So I had to fly it halfway across the world, carry it all the way up the hill, and then talk somebody into doing it. And Michael Jagger helped me put the carve out the little holes in that picture. To make it the cheese wedge. Yeah, I mean, it's like just using one of the words that we use is, hey, let's hit the cheese wedge. You know, it's like just what we talk about, but then taking it literally. So I think it's just one of those iconic images that kind of stands up to time. So I remember it cool. in the photo annual, correct? Yep, yep. Yeah. one of theirs, and just be different. And um, unique and artsy and just more timeless. So Natasha was sport enough to kind of jump up on there and, and do that for me. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. That was fun. And for those that didn't get to do it, oh, well, you lost. <laughs> do you still have the Misty Cam? I do. It's found it. In the, it's funny. My daughter was at the shop, and we we're just cleaning out the photo closet. And it's like 20 years of just stuff I've thrown in there. And she dug it out, and what's this? And then you kind of have to tell the story. Um, yeah. And it's great to tell it to your kids. That's amazing sure. that you engineered a camera. That's really cool. Thanks, yeah. Um, talking about Russell, I actually have a Patreon question. Russell. Yeah, uh -oh. this, this is from Buck Chapman. Let's give Buck oh, yeah. Chapman an air horn. Hey, Buck. Yeah, Buck. And he asks, can you give us the backstory on the iconic Russell photo? Russell Winfield. Where do you pick up a story with Russell? It doesn't go <laughs> south too quickly. <laughs> Especially back back in his youth, right? <laughs> that guy could party. <laughs> yeah, he could party. Oh, man. <laughs> Love you, Russell. Um, Rob Russell, like, it's funny because he was on the B team. Like, he wasn't always invited to come to the shoot, but he was always in the background. So he definitely pushed the generator up the hill. I guarantee he's pushed that <laughs> generator up the hill to get in front of the camera. And then um, he was on Mistral, and even back then it was like, Mistral ran, uh, whatever. But he was getting sponsored, so he's moving his way up the ranks um, uh, with that. So, again, it's it's just another one of those things where we dragged the generator up, had the Novatron. We had Strobe Wan Kenobi. And um, I could take anybody off the hill and make them Strobe Wan Kenobi. Like, I actually made a, a target on the top of the light box, and they just keep that target on the rider so they would move as the rider would move to make sure the light hit them. Um, cause you put it on a tripod, it doesn't follow the, oh, wow. right. So you're just thinking ahead and how they could help and get free help. Um, and then Russell, um, he's got that Jordan thing. I don't know if you've, him and Todd had this Jordan thing where they, the tongue would come out and they, you could tell a real good athlete because they're completely absorbed in that moment and all of their, you know, these reflexes go 
and they just start to relax like that. And then, well, then the tongue's hanging out. Tongue hangs out. <laughs> and they had wicked style on that shot for sure. And then, um, and the rest is history for Russell. Was that the same shoot as Brushy? It's one of the, yeah, we probably. Or just maybe just the same. It was a night shoot at Stratton, I guess. Well, it's probably with Jeff was probably there that day. We probably did, you know, we probably did that every weekend that we could, that we do those shoots. They and could then, just be up there doing it. Huh? And I think it's because, again, because it's dark, dark. Because that was one of the earlier shoots. Because we started learning we just shoot at dusk and then get that synchro sun going. And um, so that was one of the later shoot, earlier shoots is because we shot when it was dark. Yeah, dark. his shots has a darker background, huh? Yep. And again, it's like um, we were learning, too, because um, we're in lighter clothes. So we had that Sunset Bay sh- um, sweatshirt. So it was cold. Too bad. Yeah. Can't wear your ski jacket. You got to get in a gotta get the better good shot. Lighter, lighter shot so we can see you. You know what I was thinking about earlier when you were talking about um, how we don't have a word for a powder turn? Uh, the feeling, uh, my first thing that came to head, I was, my head, I was like, ask Russell. He'll come up with something. Yeah, he'll come yeah. up with something. Skadoosh or something <laughs> or come up with some type of, oh, we call that a skadoosh. <laughs> skadoosh. Let's make a contest and put yeah. it on Patreon let's for you. Get a, get a good word for that. Well, I let's, can't believe there isn't Let's one. run through a couple other iconic photos while we talked about that one because there's also the one I really want to get into is Trevor Andrew doing the air to fakie mm-hmm. with all the people around him. What's the story behind that? Trevor Andrew, that guy... Wow, he caught me off guard. I wrote him off. <laughs> he, he got me, man. He tricked me. Yeah, you got a little young kid from Nova Scotia on the Burton shoot, and we were in Valley Nevado in Chile. You're at about 10,000 feet, and it's a, f- it's a full heyday of Burton shoot. So every alpha shooter is there, um, and they're on the deck. So I think we had Zacher was there, um, Curtis. Those guys are all – I mean, it was like – that's what I loved in – was always intimidated by with Burton is always jam you with the best of the best and you got to float. Um, good for them. And it made all of us better for sure. And we're all friends too, as a result of it. I think you're professionally competitive and wanting to good work and that's, that's healthy. And I think that's good for the industry period. It's making better work. What's interesting with that one is like the, um, Pat Landowski shouts out that guy, man, he can make them. He made everybody look good because he would put the time and energy into making the best kickers, and and that was no exception. And that was a um, Jared Eberhard was working for JDK at the time, the creative director, and he came up with that idea of the Tyvek suits. And then we kind of populated it with uh, items that we could, you know, bring up on the hill. So you see the shovels and some of the photo gear, and just try to make this over the top. Um, situation happen and then trevor dropped in and did that air to fakey and oh, the rest is history so i think for me creatively it was like everybody was on the deck shooting because you see curtis is on the deck shooting and you can see all the other guys and their shots you know they're good but i shot i shot with a 200 back and just let it kind of fall horizontally and then let it just flow and it worked out better so again there's probably for burton to pick you know there's probably eight different shots and I got the best one. So I'm the winner that day. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Sidebar to uh, all of the photos that we're talking about here or that we've talked about on the show. If you go to bombhole.com, we're going to have a gallery with the story below it uh, of all of Trevor's photos. So sweet. Sidebar, we should get into another one, which is um, the Dave, yeah, Downing Dave Downing on the wire. On the wire. <clears throat> Great story of just sticking to your vision and not following the herd maybe that's the, the headline that we'll use here <laughs> again that was a burton shoot we did down in valley nevado argentina so to get down there you guys made that trip yet uh no yeah, it's a I long haven't. one right yeah it's a long journey long journey to get down there they party hard down that <coughs> for sure and it's um it's worth the excursion if you can get down there <clears throat> but that was um heyday of burton and then the heyday of sequences burning film like it's going out of style and there's no disrespect to um, some of the other shooters, but they were down on a on a tabletop, and there's like they're all just like from where I was standing, they look like ants. There's a ton of them just hitting, doing the same trick over and over again. And I'm sure that book that was handed in to Burton was you know this thick with a bunch of the same sequence doing the same thing. And what um, Dave Downing and I and Marcus Eggy saw was a there was. Uh, the trick is, like, I'll start with this, is that's real. 
I got hate mail. It's weird to get hate mail from people. It's like, you Photoshop this. You shouldn't be deceiving people that way. It's unauthentic. And and like, I didn't, I didn't, I saved the letter. I have it somewhere, but it's like, what? And I got three people calling me out. I was like, what? It's real. Come on. Dave will not lend his brand to doing something that's fake. And to Dave's credit, he would not let me publish that photo unless he stuck the landing. And so, We'll give shouts out to Dave for just, you know, wanting to do it the right way. And then the backstory, what you don't see is behind the scenes is there's a avalanche and it took out a ski lift and the ski lift fell down on top of a ridge of the roll, the natural roll in the ski resort. And it set it up so that this, the wire from the actual ski lift was on the snow, but we couldn't get to it. Um, you know, we tried to make a little jump and then get on it, but the second you hit it, it kind of does this whir, whir, whir thing, and you couldn't couldn't hold speed. And again, Dave wanted to make sure it was a legit trick, otherwise, no publishing. So we ended up literally spending, I want to say it was probably five hours making an in run uh, about as long as a football field. So we're literally there with our shovels, skipping lunch, just dig, 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 dig. Um, because we could see that it could happen, but it took that much work. And then you're going to come back to Burton. I'm knowing that I'm going to hand in a book this big with four photos because it's going to take me all day to get to the one. And and sure enough, it did, and it worked out well because that photo uh, still looks cool today. I've seen maybe one or two other folks that have been able to get up on a, on a ski lift wire with their skis or snowboard. Yeah, it's tough. Everything kind of lined up for us to be able to get that shot, and um, it still stands up today, I think. It looks pretty cool. When you skipped a whole other shoot to make that happen. Yeah, I just... Knowing there was other photographers yeah. there anyway, so... Yeah, they'll get it cool. Yeah. And, it, and it's it's on Dave, too, again. It's like, you know, it's like he, he committed him his time as well to just go, okay, we're going to get this done. And it's trust, I think, on his part for my, my skill sets. That, oh, Trev's going to get it. We're going to get the shot. It's worth me spending all day working on this one shot we'll get it and, and it did. would definitely run today if that happened. yeah it's cool yeah. right like it's like it just makes you look and think and how did he get up there and did the he fall above and, the mountains too yeah and there's still chairs on the on below yeah, to you let you know that it's a scary a ski lift and you know what jibber hasn't thought about it like oh i'd man, i'd love to hit that thing and yeah, it's like video game thought. totally yeah. like it's a tony hawk kind of thing where, yeah yeah and it worked and um dave actually did the trick probably three times solidly and that was the best out of the three. And he definitely uh, didn't. Well, he tried hitting it maybe 12 times total. Um, not so successfully. Never was in harm's way. It wasn't anything, like, sketchy that way. But yeah. no, no risk of getting stuck on it? No, like maybe you could slip and hit the wire, yeah. get your chin or something. But um, no, it never was a really big concern. Awesome photo. Yeah. Thanks. Last photo I want to talk about is the self-portrait of Noah Brandon. Noah Brandon. Um, you know, it's funny with GoPros and you guys don't know, but there's a GoPro here in the shot right now, but man, that changed the world. Those GoPros, man, it just made everything possible. So that shot looks like a GoPro shot, but it's not. So again, it's back to engineering and thinking about doing stuff different and then really working, working tools that aren't meant to do that and make it do what you want it to do. So what you see there is Noah Brandon, and again, one of the most underrated snowboarders of that time. He lived here in Salt Lake too. Yeah, like, he's, you know, you should probably look him up while I'm here. And he um, had to ride with an F, I think it was F five, with a motor drive. So that's probably what eight pounds. But nah, let's say five, six pounds. So you got a f- that much weight on a monopod, and he's holding on to it. And then we had to lay on the ground with this. All right, you're going to go up and you're going to do this trick. And then we had to figure out the angle on the ground and okay hold it here don't this is where he's his natural style would go that's it don't let go and then he drops in and then he'd go up and then he you know he'd be in the position and then i'd have a remote control so today it's a pocket wizard i see you have one on your desk it's yep. like cheater it makes life so easy right <laughs> yeah it makes it makes it pretty easy <laughs> <laughs> yeah well they didn't have pocket wizards back in the day see the gray hair yeah i had to figure this stuff out I so wish you had I had to do that pre pocket wizard. Yeah, I wish I had patented it. I would have been a millionaire instead of <laughs> not. But he, it was a Polaroid. Um, so again, when I worked at General Electric's, what they had was um, Polaroid had a, a radio slave basically, but it would operate a slide projector that was in the ceiling for the CEO to give presentations on the company. And so 
I took that tool and then I re-engineered it and then made it work um, because you had to put the inputs for the camera and then you know on the side there they had that one for the monitor for the um, they had a digital um, plunger right and so I literally took the wires and spliced them together taped it up made it work and then sent him in the air with it. So he had the camera and then this Polaroid pocket wizard deal. And then you'd hope he wouldn't fall. Because then you wreck the camera, you wreck the Polaroid. It'd be an sensor. expensive, It'd be just expensive a situation. <laughs> and I think we ended up using 16 mil wide angle lens on that one. And sent him up in the air. And so you'll see actually Blue Montgomery's actually on the other side of the shot. And then Noah. And then in one shot, I think I'm in it. I'm on the cu- I'm on the deck shooting, so I'm I'm in there um, shooting, it, and that was all by design at the Boreal's pipe um, late season. Dude, that's crazy! You engineered a pocket wizard before there was pocket wizard. Dude, I'm so dumb. I should have pocket. <laughs> yeah, you was right there, Yeah, you did it. That's <laughs> got all dude, mad scientists. Dude, that's crazy. You can come up with that stuff. Yeah, uh, to yeah, like know that it would work. That's you're a smart, dude. Don't trick yourself. <laughs> Welcome to the Pub Beer Crab Shoot. What are you drinking there, bud? What I got here is a delicious pub beer. Cheap, fun, and uh, always a good time. It's also beer, too. It's cheap, fun, and it's beer. And it's beer. That's pretty much all you need to know, right? Now, if you're thinking about drinking one to two beers responsibly or getting absolutely fucking obliterated and waking up face down in a gutter... What are you going to choose, bud? Pub beer every time. That's a great choice. That's a great choice. Now, with that being said, um, we're gonna we're gonna do the pub beer crap shoot. So you roll these dice that are right Boy. behind. See those? Yep, yeah. you got them. You only need two, two of them. Two of them. All right, got two. Whatever it lands on, we'll tell you what you got to do. All right, five, five. All right, what are we gonna do? All right. Name one thing still on your career bucket list. Mm. Ooh. There's a snowboard bucket list and a career bucket list. The snowboard one's Chamonix. I haven't got that in my quiver of tricks. I've been blessed to go to many amazing resorts and mountains. Um, so that's on my list. And career-wise, um, it's probably transitioning from or exiting my business at some point. I'd love to be able to retire, <clears throat> you know, and then kick it wherever the hell I want because <laughs> I can. Because I'm old and that's what I want to do. So that's probably, hopefully, everybody's goal at some point. So that would be a career opportunity. There's others um, entrepreneurially, you know, Pocket Wizard. I think I should reinvent that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Dude, think of how rich you would have been had you put that out. <laughs> I blew it. <laughs> yeah, you should spend the rest of this podcast thinking about how rich you would have been had you came with up with podcast, Pocket Wizard. <laughs> with, with the Pocket Wizard. Those things right. fail all the no, time. I was going to say, too. my experience as a rider <laughs> with a pocket wizard is that you got to do the trick 40 times because they don't go off on the one you my land. My Ellen Chrome's not firing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. True story. So I know over the course of your career, you spent some time down south in New Zealand. New Zealand, if you all get to go, put it on your bucket list. It's an amazing, amazing place. It's so beautiful. Uh, it reminds me of Oregon in a lot of ways. But I think the probably the story with New Zealand is it was sort of the um, extension of the TG business, the Trevor Grace photo business, was taking the game to New Zealand. And <clears throat> what I would do is I'd set up production houses, basically. So I'd go down, I'd rent a house. Remember the one that I had was right over, there's a, you know, the bungee was starting to take off, so AJ Hackett bungee. So we had a house that just kind of oversat the canyon and oversat the bungee jump, and then right there in Queenstown. So I'd sell commercial packages to the brands and say, hey, bring your team down. I'll babysit them. I mean, I'll shoot them professionally, and then we'll go and get the goods for you. So it'd sell week packages. Uh, you'd go for a week, and then you bring the next crew in, the next crew, the next crew, and then um, that would be your summer revenue. Because the, the not genius thing about being the best snowboarder in the world is the seasonality of it. That hit me. It's like, oh, August is here. I'm out of, we're out of editorial money. Damn. Uh, and that was the answer, um, just out of pure necessity of trying to keep keep the lights on. And then you'd get to bring people in, like you name it. They all came through. So when I when you first said it, I remember having I did one shoot at the house where I literally would just take the deck 
It's 10 by 10 deck. And I would force myself to have to shoot portraits in that small space. So I remember having Billy Anderson in, Noah Brandon, Rocket Reeves, uh, Dale, Sweeze. I mean, you name it, they would all come through um, and and hit up in the houses and, and we'd go snowboarding in New Zealand. What would people pay for the week? That's secret. I really can't go into those kind of details. <laughs> and actually what I'm saying is I don't even remember. You don't even know. It's like it just went. Whew. But you were booked all uh, summer pretty I was, much. I was busy working. Yep. For that's, sure. That's a smart move. That's really cool. The place is amazing too because it's summer here. So you go yeah. out of like su- full summer mode and all of a sudden you're packing your board bag and it's, you know, 80 degrees where you're living and then you show mm-hmm. up and it's always like kind of like a fun <laughs> vibe whenever you go to New Zealand. But all of our, you know, friends here, it's not, it's very frowned upon, especially oh, back it? then. Oh, and I remember getting pulled over. Well, there's two pullover stories. One's Rocket Reeves getting pulled over. Whoopsh, whoopsh, sorry, Rocket. And he got the treatment. Really? And, oh, yeah. And then um, another one is that they've, there was like cocaine being shipped in surfboards. And the, the um, security guys are like, it's a board. There's cocaine in there. And we're like, no. They thought it was in the snowboard? Yeah, in the snowboard. So they wanted to break the snowboards apart to get in there to see where the cocaine was. Because we're dirty butt snowboarders. We must be shipping cocaine. Because otherwise, we'd be, why would we be here? I don't know. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and talked him out of that. I end up doing a lot of that actually. I'm gonna talk our way out of stuff just to keep it moving. But, but they gave Rocket that treatment on just a pullover, huh? Or yeah, was that the airport? Yeah, he um you know, he uh, engaged before he got on the plane oh. and set the dogs off. Mm. And uh the rest is history. The rest is history. That's his dinner story. That yeah, that was his before expense. they had the fancy x ray machine, the body x ray machine, I imagine. Yeah, maybe they were just <laughs> bored, I don't know. <laughs> Looking for something fun to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's a good time to uh, do a little pivot here. I haven't been beating that word to death lately. I'm going to bring it back. No, um, uh, talking about Nemo, which is basically the the reason I found out about Nemo was through the robot food videos. I'd see your guys' logos and stuff like that. Um, and you started a design firm. Mm-hmm. And before we get into that, we have a guest question from Mark Lumen. Oh, boy. Here we go. Hey, Trevor. Mark here, long-time listener, first-time caller. So you run a design firm called Nemo. Tell us a little bit about why you called that company Nemo, and what does the name mean? Where did that come from? Thanks. He's playing it down. That's Mark Lumen, my business partner. And if you've ever watched uh, Jackass, Wild Boys, he's the freak that sits in the other room and thinks of tortures. For those poor individuals. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's so chill, and all of a sudden he's like, "Oh yeah, alligator bites his butt." Like, all right, it's in the movie, it's in this, it's in the TV show. So that's um part of Mark's uh, <laughs> legacy for sure. But that guy was in BMX way before you know. Les, you know, he he actually hired Spike Jones as if I don't know Spike was sixteen or something. That's wow. that's where he came up the rank. So. And the fun story with that is, I guess, Nemo started to grow. I will answer the question. Is um, we started getting some Nike work, and I'm not a creative director. I'm not very good at wordsmithing. If you watch my spelling, you won't think I'm that smart. And I needed that guy. And I knew Mark was living in Eugene, and I wanted him to do it. So I had Matt Hoffman introduce us at the uh, Tony Hawk Boom Boom Huck Jam. So I was working for Tony's sister, doing the PR stuff for that. And then I got to meet Mark Lumen. Hey, Mark want to come work for Nemo? And he started commuting up the road. Anyway, the rest is history. He's still there. Appreciate seeing that guy every single day. And uh, thanks for doing all the hard creative. Appreciate it. But the word Nemo is, um, if you've read the book, John Krakauer's Into the Wild. So the main character basically tags everything with Nemo, Nemo, Nemo. He's inspired by the book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Captain Nemo. And actually what's interesting is Lake Powell is way down. So, the one in the story is he goes in, there's a, a hut, and he carves Nemo, Nemo, Nemo into the wood of the door frame. And I'm wondering if that's out of the water now. Oh, wow, they yeah, because the, it the and, water's down. Yeah, the water's down, so I want to go out and grab that piece of wood because that's where the name Nemo actually ended up coming from. You better do it before this podcast <laughs> comes out. Someone right. else is going to. Yeah, go and get it. Maybe get it and sell it to me and make a bunch of money. <laughs> All my uh, pocket wizard money. But the, um, but the other one was the... Um, you know, the Nemo, too, is like at the time, you know, Wyden and Kennedy, who does all Nike's great advertising, it sounds like a lawyer. And it's sort of, 
egocentric. It's about Dan Wyden, nice guy, no disrespect, just the way they did it, but it just didn't feel right. It's like, hey, if I'm going to get the best creatives in the world to work for me, why are they going to work for Trevor Graves? You know, it just sounds stiff. Yeah, like it's, a firm, like you're saying, a lawyer firm. And this isn't us. And I have friends that are lawyers. Sorry, guys, but it's like, you know, it's just not how we wanted to do it. We really wanted to make this collaborative agency. And the, and the entrepreneurial opportunity then was like, you had the, either the big agency, like a Wyden and Kennedy that did everything, or, you know, you didn't have something to do just the cool creative. So that's what we wanted to be was just this part. And it served us well for whatever, 23 years now. And the name is still kind of working for us. Nemo, boom, boom. It's got a little punch to it. And so that's the, that's the background story on why Nemo. Thanks for asking, Mark Lehman. And then after 23 years, how many employees you got over there? 23, so about, it's funny because right now we're probably at 30 full-timers and I always call our permalancers. We got people that work for us on a regular basis. Permalancers. <laughs> yeah, that's what we call them. But, um, Permanent freelance. Yeah, and they, um, they provide a tremendous value and they usually have a unique skill set that they um, sometimes can farm out to other agencies or, or brands, but we'll work with them frequently and they make tons of money on us as they should they got a good skill that's awesome i think it would be good for the listeners to understand exactly what a design firm does yeah if anybody's out again we've learned today that to be a photographer out of college is probably the least paying job the third (laughs) (laughs) worst sad (laughs) the third worst is the designer (laughs) so don't be a designer when you grow up you won't make any money Uh, i'm just kidding so the design um agency so we, we've positioned ourselves, again, you, you can watch Mad Men and see what an ad agency is, and they kind of um, really, at the beginning, would set up uh, media buying, and then they would take 15% off the top as their fee, and that's sort of how the business structure was set up for, let's say, a traditional ad agency. For a design firm, what we'll do is we call ourselves a brand design firm for the active lifestyle, so we really try to focus the clients that we serve as all the brands that you guys in this audience would want to participate with. So again, today we got a shoot up at um, Powder Mountain for North Face. We do the Icon Ski Pass. We've done Mastercraft Wakeboard Boats, Nike 6.0. Um, and you can see there's so many resorts, so many ski brands that we've done work for um, because we want to. So again, that attracts designers that want to work on those type of brands and then you get this whole ecosystem, sort of like Apple. It all kind of works amongst itself because then clients come to you because they want the authenticity of that type of work because that person's sitting at the desk and is able to do the work, the design work. So it's the best of both worlds, and it means I don't have to work as hard. Like they just, It just works itself. I don't have to go recruit and spend thousands of extra dollars to get somebody to sit there and, and do the work. So that's the difference is we usually don't do the media piece. <coughs> Amazing. Now, I, I heard an early story from Mark about um, when you guys were kind of just getting your foot in the door. Smith was oh. a company that wanted to potentially, you actually recording them more so. Can you tell the story of <clears throat> trying to get Smith as a client? Yeah, there's um, beginning days of Nemo. The first job we had was Michelle Taggart's Solomon graphic. I think about 1500 bucks for that. That's probably going right today, but that's what we got. Second client was High Cascade. The third client was Smith Sport Optic. And they, um, they're they based in Idaho at the time. They came into town. And I um, I don't want to give all the secrets away. I faked it till I made it. Um, so what they wanted, they thought, on the phone I'm talking to them, I go, you guys are too small. And I go, oh, no, no, we're not. We've got a lot of people here. You should come see us. So I set it up. I called my friend's hey, can you come and sit at the computer <laughs> and pretend you know what you're doing <laughs> for this meeting? <laughs> That's so rad. So we literally had them sitting. We had a bunch of people just sitting at the computers, and we put them in. We had, this is where the robot food guys were sitting, but we'd sit at the table and then, um, you know, and do the, you know, hey, hey here's who's the agency. This is how we can do the work, da, da, da. And they had, um, they had a traditional agency doing their work, but they didn't have active lifestyle branding agency doing their work <laughs> so they didn't know what they weren't they didn't know but it was a great time and um the charade worked and they fell in love with us and did the work and we worked with smith we took them from i guess maybe more of a regional brand to really an international brand um you know 
They had like seven different fonts. I mean, there's little design cues that were way off that were easy for us to upgrade and fix. Um, but that was a fun era. That was really great work. That's incredible, dude. Just putting you guys are too small. Office. Just like call a bunch of your buddies. Hey, can you just like come punch away at a keyboard and pretend like you're and working? Bring your computer from home. <laughs> set it up here. Yeah, that, that happened. And they'd get up and walk around once in a while. And, yeah, <laughs> act like they're all busy working on stuff. <laughs> cue, cue the deer. <laughs> That is incredible. <laughs> so you guys at one point went from, I think it's 2005 to 2006, you went from 13 people to 70 people. Mm, yep. um, how, is, how is that? Um, what's, the, what's the business term for that? Um, exponential, exponential growth. Exponential growth, yeah. Yeah, exponential um, growth. Yeah, again, for everybody. Scaling was what I was thinking scaling, of. Scaling, scaling yeah. but yeah. So there's, there's some numbers again. So if I'm sure if I went to business school, I probably would have known these numbers, but maybe it's a good thing I didn't because you just, young and dumb and you just do it anyway figure it out um so again for us it, what i've learned since this experiment was if you grow let's say 20 25 percent each year it's sustainable but if you grow you know 100 percent every year it's not sustainable and what you're going to expect is that people are going to quit the client will fire you i mean because you aren't able to pr provide the service at 100 percent of the quality that you can when you're properly staffed for the work and even like again when Big agency, big company like Microsoft will interview you. They're going to make sure that you're not going to, you can handle their work. Because um, if you don't have the right staffing, they see it. There's just so much experience in these failures. Um, and I set us up to get beat down. <laughs> um, so I've talked ourselves into um, doing Nike.com. Nike.com at the time was the largest flash e-commerce site in the world. And our job was to populate the infrastructure of the website with all of the branded content um, for the experience for the end consumer. And you had to move into digital. It was starting to be a thing and we were ready. We're doing it. And so literally probably two weeks, two weeks into the project, the digital team that I had quit and started their own agency. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> like, oh, good for you. And I'm still friends <laughs> with those guys today, but it was like, Oh, okay. And then, um, and then it was like, you know, game on after that. Hard, hard life lessons of like never never being able to perform properly enough. So would I do it again? Probably. Good thing, bad thing, who knows? It was um a definitely a learning curve. But um and again, again, what's what is success? How big do you actually need to be to be successful? It doesn't think more isn't always better. I think our society thinks more, more, more is success. And it's like I've learned through the wisdom is like this is enough. This is this works. This is great. I have enough time for family, friends. I'm making enough revenue. I can put stuff away for when I retire. Um, and I think today, as a result of that, is like I know what works, and that's why the size of the shop is what it is today. That's Love smart. that. Sidebar: uh, Was listening to this podcast with Jeff Curl, who is the founder of Stance, and has more money than uh, he's also founded Skull Candy, big entrepreneur guy. But it was, I think I've said this on the show before. I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but he mentioned that, um, you know, this guy's got more money than he knows, what to, he knows what to do with, you know. And he's like, I boil it down to one thing. I just enjoy going to an office with a small group of people and making something cool. Yep. And, and if that, if you can just think of your company as that, and I, that's what Buds and I do with this, it's like, you just think of it. It's not like there's that, that misconception that once we hit this much, then, we're going to be happy. And I love that kind of, uh, you just kind of shot that theory in the foot. Well, you grow to your point of least effectiveness. It's called the Peter principle. And what it ends up being, it's like, I got a guy, Jay Floyd. Hey Jay, I hate you. He, um, it's been with me for 23 years and for good thing, bad thing. We'll see. No, I'm just kidding. But it's like the, um, if I was to promote him to a VP, he'd fail. And he'd have to leave the company. I'd ultimately end up firing him because he wouldn't be able to perform. But as an art director, dude is top notch. He's the king. But he knows that's where his sweet spot is and he'll stay in that zone. Um, so that means he probably can't get to the 250K price tag, but he knows what he's good at and that's what he can do and he's comfortable at doing that. So we've had those conversations. For and sure. he's probably happier. <clears throat> yeah, he's happier. And, and he's, he's not being set up to fail and all that. Yeah. And so it, it is. Um, the Peter principle, huh? Peter Prince. It's a real thing, I guess. Harvard, somebody, I don't know, smarter than me figured it out. But 
I've read about it along the way. Read about it in a book. Now, uh, sidebar question. You guys are a firm that basically a company comes to you and says, hey, we want to do an ad or we want you guys to come up with a concept for our launch, for our fall line or whatever the hell this shit is, right? Yep. And so a huge part of that is creativity. Okay, let's let's spin the wheels and figure out how to come up with a concept for this ad. How do you guys foster creativity over at Nemo? Yeah, we have um, a big HVAC system at the top, and we just push weed into it, <laughs> and it just <laughs> permeates across the building, and people get creative. <laughs> Microdosing works, yeah, too. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> we, should, we should get that at the bottom. Yeah. Just blow weed in the vents. It totally works. Trust me. Take that one to the bank. <laughs> Put that with, right next to the pocket wizard, and we'll call it good. Bingo. I it You know, with creativity, I think that's the thing that gets, you know, starving artists for a reason. I don't think people give that creative enough creed and how to nurture it is really kind of the magic uh, to be able to keep it repeating on itself and it is people again that's what's hard with this pandemic is everybody gets locked away and pushed away from each other and yet it's when the best stuff happens i'm sure you've all been on a zoom call can't wait for it to end and yes i'm glad that it happened and the technology was available when it was and all that timing is great but i much prefer a live interaction and that's when you start getting this fast back and forth and that's what we want to make happen I, when i look at our building it's really just a creative hub it's just a resource for people to collaborate in so there's a photo studio you can go in and shoot you can you know get over in the conference room there's big whiteboards you can just stick stuff up on the wall there's these big printers like a bunch of stuff or just tools that people can just get get creative on because that's ultimately what the client's paying for is this creative solution it's just you know when i watch mark lumen do it it's like he makes it look easy in his process i don't know if we can make a map or we can patent it but he comes up and it's like poof like, he solved it whoa it was took him one second i'm sure you've all heard that plumber thing guy charged you 200 dollars an hour he comes in tweaks one thing 10 minutes and you still got to pay him 200 bucks an hour why it only took you two minutes like because it took me 30 years of knowing what to do <laughs> right and that's Mark Lewin's story and his creativity process. Like, um, he'll always come up with something. We always call it a Luminism um, to get us get the client to where we need to with the with the next campaign. Luminism, a Luminism. I love that. I think it's a fascinating concept because creativity. You know, a lot of people. It's like you know, how do you get where you're going? It's hard work. You know, hard work. And and I think you do actually have to apply yourself. There has to be effort applied creatively to to get good but and as far as fostering inspiration that's a whole other thing it's like cataloging and fostering inspiration to me is you know for artists even for us we have a little line of clothing and you're like oh you see something you're walking you're like damn you see that take a photo with your phone that's mm -hmm. things cool like but i don't know fostering inspirations is a fascinating topic or just giving the giving the platform just to do it um, we definitely had like Frenchie, one of our guys did a big art show. Um, again, creatively, we've done a bunch of board graphics where we just give everybody like, okay, here you go. You get the board graphic go. I think I got, in, I want to say 500 graphics over the years. You've done? Not me. I'm terrible. Oh. I did a t-shirt once. <laughs> we can talk about that just for Nemo's a couple Just Nemo's done 500? <laughs> yeah, Nemo. Jeff Bartel has been the main guy on the, on the board graphic front for us, but yeah. That's a lot of graphics. Lots of graphics. Now, what do you think the key ingredients are to the success of Nemo? Um, definitely that ventilator trick. <laughs> weed in the, ven yeah. weed in the ventilator weed system? Weed in the HVAC. Um, trying to think of it as like one word, and it's probably just authenticity. Um, you know, you go in these companies, they always have their company mantras and manifestos and up on the wall, and it's sort of, it isn't really, it isn't really authentic in some ways, in my opinion. But for us, it says authenticity is everything on the front door. And there's a big, cool placard everybody Leo made. And then it um, it's a lot of this action sports credo, right? Like you can't fake any of the tricks that we're doing. You could die doing the tricks. You got to you gotta show up and be a present. You can't fake it. And that credo still comes through in us as leadership for our company and the people that want to work there want to be part of it, even if they're not action sports people like our accountant still wants to be part of that because it feels like you're um, authentically connected to a group of people as a tribe and not um, another wheel in the cog. Hurry up, make it faster, or I'm going to fire you. 
it just doesn't exist in our building. And that, as a team and a whole unit, keeps people around. It's interesting is the tenure, like um, turnover. One of the questions I always suggest to a um, young person interviewing at an agency is ask, what is your turnover rate? It's a tough question for that person on the other end because it, typically for ad agencies, it's about, I don't know, 18 months, two years. And for Nemo, it's about seven so seven years, seven years, they stick around. Other people want fresh ideas or something. So they're cycling through they're employees. They're not happy with their oh, they're not happy work with environment. Even. Yeah. They're just, uh, and then people quit leaders. They don't quit the job. Wow. Right. So they stick around. And I think if that's true, and I'm sure somebody at Harvard said it, so it must be true. They're sticking around because of our leadership skills and just being authentic people. We're never trying to nickel and dime everybody to get the last bit of money out of some designer or anybody on our team. We just want everybody to kind of come to work, kick ass, be proud about the work, be proud about the clients that we're serving and just do a good job. It's not that hard, um, but you authentically want to show up. And I think part of it's a screening at the front end. You try to weed out the potential bad eggs in the interview process. We've gotten pretty good at sniffing out with our emotional intelligence, like who's going to be the stinker. We've had a few go through. Um, that makes my day hard because it's a lot to get those cancers out of your building. Uh, and True. Dam- and then people, when you don't get them out quick enough, other people start quitting because you're not getting rid of that bad guy. So it happens. Yeah. Wow. Incredible advice. Uh, another thing I wanted to just highlight what you're just saying too, is think about the authenticity and skateboarding and snowboarding is like skateboarders, snowers. I hate to say it. We're fucking haters. <laughs> we're fucking haters like naturally you're like that back dick it's back that back lip was shitty like it is front nine he barely grabbed whatever you know we're we're sticklers for better for worse it's probably in the grand scheme of things not a great thing but i think and they're you know in, in our in our sport it's quick to be like oh that guy's full of shit or whatever mm-hmm. you know yep. but as bad as that can be and as elitist as skateboarders and snubbers can be as, as smug pricks they are, <laughs> or myself is, I should say, mm-hmm. um, it's probably a great thing for creating quality products mm-hmm. in for Nemo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All that action sports DNA. Um, but just think about, think about the industry. Spike Jones, come on. Like he's one of us and he's world renowned in the work that he's produced. Jeff Tremaine. You know, it's a niche product, but man, those guys are crushing it with that franchise. Um, he's one of us. He was the art director at Snowboarder. Like, and there's something again when you look at the all the production crews; they're all snowboard skateboarders. You know, Brian Aguchi's brother is on a lot of those sets. Um, he saw it after. It's in they're running them. Bruno Musso shut skateboards out of New York. He's on. He's producer for a lot of these sets. So it's like. There's something to this changing environment that action sports people are really in depth at doing. And on the creative side, they're usually the best. Um, they're just used to think about it. Like basketball and that's always there. It's always in the same spot, but snowboarding, it's constantly moving. It, it's always to get to the good spot. It's always moving. And the next day it'll snow. It's different. You got to, your brain's got to adjust on the fly all the time. That's constantly training you to be consistently creative you got to reinvent the wheel every time just to have fun and maybe even not get killed. Not getting killed on a basketball court. Go up to AK, yeah, you could get killed. There's a lot of ways to, to yeah. die Paris up there plane. or just snowboarding in general. Jeez. Yeah. we got a dangerous little fun thing we do here. Especially, I like that comparison with conventional sports too because in conventional sports you show up, the coach says, okay, this is what we're working on. Yep. The coach should, on the sideline says, hey, this is where you need to be better. Coach, coach makes a plan. And sure, there's degrees of creativity here and there, but for the most part, you're following the coach's plan. Mm-hmm. Snowboarding, at least from there's my no perspective, plan. there's no coaches. Yeah. Nope. And and you go out and you figure it out, and there's no roadmap. And you it actually is, you're empowered to be creative. You see the people that are authentically themselves generally mm-hmm. are beloved. Yep. And um, yep. it's totally, an, and then it's an interesting analogy there. Well, to become that next big pro, you got to do something different too. Mm-hmm. So you do always have to change. Well, the industry celebrates, or to, like you say, it elevates those that are bringing something new, whether it's a trick, new video edits, like all that stuff, they're always celebrated. You look at, if you're doing that inside the factory, you're changing it, you're usually frowned upon. And we've seen that in the government too. Don't change it, keep it the same. It's like the more you move away from it, the more you get thrown in jail. 
Um, and it's completely opposite in our culture and in with this group of people. So congratulations. Don't change it. Celebrate it. Embrace it and be part of it. Yeah, yeah. totally. Well said. An- another sidebar, though, a lot of times, <laughs> if you have to tell if you have to tell a, an athlete or a, a professional snowboarder or skateboarder or something to do, they're, they're not going to take gonna instructions. Yeah. Well, oh, you want me to do that? I'm actually nope. going to do the opposite. <laughs> they're pains in the F fucking Yeah, they ass. love to do whatever the opposite of what you say. Do you still shoot photos? I do. Nice. Yep. How can you not? Right? Yeah, it's true. so fun. It is part of the, when I look, wake up, I look at myself as a shooter for sure. Um, but again, bidding, you know, am I a shooter because I'm not getting paid professionally to shoot the North Face thing today? Probably, but nah. I still think like a shooter and look in stills. And every time you're driving, you're framing stuff up constantly. I'm sure you guys do the same thing. Yeah. I'm waiting. Uh, my wife and I will joke is the, uh, we got the app and it's the uh, Magic Hour app. And we're always guessing how many minutes until magic hour. Oh, really? And for those that don't know, it's that golden sun at the end of the day. It's when you want to shoot pictures because they look better. Um, but There's actually an app it. for magic hour. Yeah, look it up. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, makes life makes it, um, yeah, fun. But you don't shoot campaigns for Nemo? <clears throat> nope. A few reasons. Again, it's like my, my role and job has changed, and I think it's smarter to bring in people that are experts that do the job better. Again, like Josh Letchworth for shooting. I can shoot wakeboarding. I do okay. Um, but again, if we bring in the expert that gets in the water and wears the diaper and it floats, like <laughs> we're going to get better stuff. I'm yeah. not that guy. So I have to realize there's a limitation of where I'm going to be contributing um, for the success of the campaign. Sometimes we can make more money if I shoot, but it sometimes is, that's not the right decision. Who's the right person to shoot this campaign? And that's, we're always trying to push the client to get the, the best, whoever it is. Sometimes we can't afford them, um, but we're always looking out for that. And you're looking on the gram, seeing the new styles of photographers and mm-hmm. finding these new people. And that's the fun part. Like, yeah. I'm always pushing those guys, check this guy out, check this guy yeah. out, check this guy out. And it may take a few different tries until they, um, we get one in. But, yeah, that's, that's fun. Cool. That's the fun I have, part. I have a question. What is your role at Nemo? Mostly just answer the front door for the FedEx guy. <laughs> and this is true. <laughs> <laughs> um. I end up, uh, everybody wears a few different hats and end up more like Papa Smurf, I guess. You end up being like the president, I guess, is the role. There's a CEO, but it's not, I don't really do CEO because it's kind of a cleared. CEO to me is kind of setting the vision and the direction of the company. I do a little bit of that, but we share that with the leadership team. So there's five people on our leadership team that kind of all collaborate on what we're going to do and where we're going to go. I wanted to be part of their DNA as well as mine. I don't want to dictate like, hey, we're going to be this X, Y, Z, P, D, Q. Like, it's not that cool. And it actually makes it harder to do it that way, uh, to get everybody to kind of buy in. Uh, you got to have a yeah, better case study or story and evidence of where we want to go with stuff. And then I end up doing the stuff that nobody else wants to do or needs to do. I guess I'm like the um, managing partner. So I'll do the real estate deals. I'll do, um, if we end up having a deal with lawyers, I'm the guy that has to deal with lawyers. It's not the fun part. I'm on sales quite a bit at the front end and being able to get the client come in to the building and be interested in our services. That's fun. I like doing that part of our job. Um, but yeah, the dishes need to get done. I'll do those. Papa Smurf. Yeah. Now sidebar. Uh, I don't know why I keep saying sidebar. <laughs> it's not really sidebar. But I'm gonna just gonna, we're going to keep rolling with that. So there's a lot of people that listen that, you know, I was, we were there at some point where you're like, I got this idea for a brand. I'm thinking about starting it. doesn't matter if it's what the brand is, mm-hmm. but you've started your brand. It's been massively successful. What advice do you have for the young person that's trying to start a brand or thinking about starting a brand? Well, some of the stuff we talked about earlier, it's a game of who you know. So it's not enough just to have the idea. It's like you got to have all the other connection points to actually make it grow. What is success? Is selling 10 t-shirts success? Yeah, for somebody it might be. But again, if we want to make, a, again, when I hear, I'll read into what you're asking is like a multi-million dollar company that could be acquired by VF Corporation. You know, that's big for our industry. And you need so many different types of people. So it's not enough to just be a creative designer that can make a cool t-shirt. You have to think like an entrepreneur. And when I say entrepreneur, what their creative pen or brush is, is people. They learn how to use people's natural gifts to be able to create the vision of what the brand or the company can actually be and become. And so they're really nurturing um, 
those people's skill sets uh, as a contribution or as a whole uh, to make this brand grow big, right? Because it's and along the way you're going to have different needs. The team that got you started isn't going to be the team that's going to get you acquired by VF. It's like they're just way different type of personalities. So again, you got to decide. And I've seen those people at the end of the chain. Like they're not going to be on your podcast. You're not going to hang out with some of those guys. They're necessary for business. I get it, but um, yeah, I don't usually hang out with some of those guys. They're definitely yeah, they're in the money. Like, and sometimes that's all it needs to be at the end. But I don't want to have to play there. Now I see you wearing that Y Yeast Academy shirt. Yes. Uh, what's going on with that? Y Yeast is um, if you're not familiar. Or just the quick backstory, our second largest client when we started was High Cascade Snowboard Camp. And then they got acquired by Van, so we used to hang out and eat hot dogs with Steve Van Doren, good dude. And then, um, and where would we all be without that experience at Hood? That was like Mecca, to use a religious reference for us and snowboarding, was to get up to the mountain at Mount Hood every summer. Everybody's gone through there, you name it, Jamie Lynn, you name it, everybody's gone through that camp. And so that's our alma mater. For all that, we're all kind of on the same team. <clears throat> and then um, and then there's a merger, High Cascade merged with Wendell's. And then the popularity of camps has kind of waned over the years, I think, with the global warming and people kind of finding other interests because there's plenty of new things to do, like, I don't know, go skydiving, who knows, right, what everybody's going to move into. And Kevin English, to his genius, decided to go uh, with Tim Wendell and make a nonprofit, a nonprofit um, charter sc- or um, boarding school. So again, East Coast, it's pretty popular to go to boarding schools. Out here on the West Coast, it's not as popular, but they're definitely bringing in people from the East Coast to attend this academy. So Y East Academy is a high school. Uh, it's a boarding school up in Welch's at the campus, which used to be High Cascade um, Snowboard Camp, for all those that remember Tim Bedell's spot. So basically, it's a 20-acre plot. It was originally had like a hotel, motel kind of set up on it, and they've retrofitted it to be this, this school. And again, there's a lot of hoops legally. Again, you have young children. There's a lot of legal hoops that those guys have to go through to be a certified school. They've gone through all that. They have all the right people in place to be a school, and think about how cool it is. I say people, purpose, and passion is sort of what they're thinking about. I know for you guys, it's just for me, the best educations I've ever gotten is on the road. You know, how to deal with money in Italy. Like, you know, language, cultural differences, all that stuff humbled me and made me a better person. And this is what they're able to bring to their their contingency. So you have... Right now, they've got a lot of, let's call it skiers, mountain bikers, skateboarders, and snowboarders that attend their univer- their camp, I mean their, their um, school, and they get quality teaching, and they don't have to go to regular school, and they get coaches. And so for those that want to go to the Olympics, they have a coach that will now take them to all the PSTA qualifying events, coach them, school them, making sure they're getting everything done at night, feeding, transporting them, putting them around the country. And they've, uh, God, I forgot the skier's name. Super cool kid. He's got second at uh, the Olympics this time, this time around out of their camp. So now for us as, a, as, a, as an industry, you know, we have our Harvard. You know, we have this spot where we can kind of come back and reflect and have some kind of kin to. And so that's my part of it. So I sit on the board of directors with Kevin and team and try to help advise and give resources to be able to help grow this idea I'm all about like changing up the school system. Um, and I think it's set up to make factory workers left over from the industrial revolution. Yet when we think and we meet our friends, they're also unique and gifted in different ways. And so, you know, for us and athletes uh, in snowboarding, so their gift is their physical skills. Others, you know, can do sales. Some can do creative and art. And what Kevin's trying to do is bring all that in here and have these people be able to come and do those programs at a high school level, travel the world and go snowboarding and mountain biking. And, and, and what a cool way to grow up. And now that's their, who do they know? All those kids are going to grow up. They're going to be people in the industry. They're going to run stance. They're going to run Burton and they're going to come up out of this high school at some point in time. So what we're doing right now is working on fundraising to try to get more money 
um, I forgot the technical word for it, but basically a reserve to give kids that don't have the money to be able to uh, give them a scholarship so they can't attend Hawaii East Academy. So there's a lot of work and energy on that whole team's part, Bobby Meeks included, to get to um, trying to figure out how to get this money, this pool of money, to be able to help these kids out. You think about somebody like Sean White, like that kid didn't come from means. He was literally living in a van at Big Bear with his family, four of them in a Ford van. It sat behind Nemo for like three years. He only owned it for a while. And um, what if this is available to him? Where would he have gone? Congratulations, Sean. You've had a wonderful career. That's awesome. But I could see somebody that didn't have those means being able to come through this school. And again, keep this industry moving. We got to keep bringing on the next generation in order to have an industry. Um, if they don't keep coming and have an interest in this, and we don't, you don't have a job, you know. Unfortunately, the part of the capitalism is we kind of, kind of need that circle to kind of keep feeding us. So, um, good thing, bad thing, who knows? But for today's conversation, that's sort of the the gist on what Y East is doing. Love it. I wish I was able to go to school like that. Dude. What's funny too is you meet all these people in snowboarding that have these skills. They didn't get any of them from school. It's like you're either naturally a sales guy or you're an mm-hmm. artist. Yep. None of it came from the drilling they did on arithmetic or mm-hmm. or anything, you know. So it's a – I mean, you look at Trevor Andrews said he mm-hmm. – ninth grade he was done with school. And it's just look at look how he's done for himself. He also <laughs> mentioned that he would uh, basically like mail T-shirt graphics to West Beach via the mail. And, you know, and had T-shirt designs getting made because of when snowboarding 14, when right? he was 15 and st- things like that. And it's amazing how snow – you can go to school yeah. for years and be a graphic designer – and never once see a brand make one of your shirts, but if you're in the snowboard world, you can kind of surpass connect all those that. dots. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of like being able to go to Hogwarts, but for snowboarding, huh? Dude, I'm gonna steal that. <laughs> totally stealing that idea. <laughs> <laughs> Take it. <laughs> yeah, you. and the coaches there are ripping <laughs> snowboards too. I know yeah, a I mean, you got Bobby Meeks. He's just yep. a big kid too, and yep. loves snowboarding and. It's good to see, like you were saying, in the pan- pandemic, they just thrive, too, mm-hmm. when you would think maybe camps would be going out of business. So it's nice they were able to recreate yep. and do that. <clears throat> yeah, pivot. Do and they then, take old people? I'd like to go to this academy. Yeah, go back for uh, your GED or something? Yeah, something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. We'll make, it, make an exception. You know, it's interesting, <laughs> sidebar, too. I noticed a lot of the people that sit in that chair that have been, like, really successful on their snowboards tend to all have supportive parents that are, like, mm-hmm. Well, yeah, we got you. We'll back you, you know, common theme. And that's what's cool is like if you're a supportive parent, you want your kids, your kids into snowboarding, send them to Y East. It's fucking awesome. He made another connection too. a lot of the really good athletes had an absent father too. True. Which maybe gave him some drive. Yeah. Also, Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And, and even that's the best of the best. Even another one. <laughs> if we're going to talk about creativity. I was watching this documentary, a sports doc, about the the greats, like the true greats. It was like um, Wayne Gretzky, uh, Jerry Rice, and, and what they all had in common. And there's a lot of players that got really good at a young age, and they got they got they're phenomenal players. But what separates the the good NFL, you know, NBA players, et cetera, from the greats was unstructured play. So, for example, Wayne Gretzky would play out on the pond. He'd play pond hockey, and he would play this game where he'd shoot into a trash can, and he'd play with his friends. And when you play with your friends, there's no coaches telling you what to do. Mm-hmm. So you start fucking around like how skateboarders do or mm-hmm. snowboarders Basically do. Basically having Absolutely. fun. And so you had that creative mindset of, you know, creative thinking on the ice. How can I be creative to get the puck where it needs to go? And what is skateboarding? What is snowboarding? It's creative thinking when you're not coached. It's how do I figure out how to backflip this rail or whatever it is. How do I get a more beautiful clip that nobody's ever done how do i do this thing differently um and i i don't know it was just fascinating to me yeah it's interesting yeah maybe we can manufacture the next <laughs> that's what they got to figure out play at yeah. uh, weed smoke coming out of the, the billowing vents. out of the vents <laughs> billowing <laughs> pocket wizards that don't ever get manufactured or but break. they never break work. yeah that's they never they actually work for you yeah. all right let's get into hot takes Hot takes. First thing first, we always ask MJ of snowboarding, both male and female, who you got? You know, I'd say Sean White, and there's a few reasons I'd say Sean. Um, 
he's he you know he gets dissed in our industry because of his competitive nature and he's kind of a loner in a little bit in that way but he's a super nice guy when you get right down to it i've always enjoyed him and in the raj and his brother and his mom it's like they've always been part of the road trips but um he, it's like when you got to drop in and some of the tricks that you're doing without a bag remember that big red bull pit? there's no bag in there for him to learn that stuff and then Unfortunately for Sarah Burke, she paid the biggest price for progression and didn't make it. That was here in Utah too, right? Yeah, it was at yeah, Park City. Like, I think. So, yep. Um, you know that was all the game. I think the other part is a. I always see in Jordan his team play, um, and handing. You know, Jordan was always good at handing the ball uh, to Pippen or whoever else and, and making it about a team. Maybe a little bit more of that, so I wouldn't say it completely there. Um, but and then just the uh, when I think of Sean too is the. Jordan did baseball, you know, and then Sean with his skate career. I think we all forget that he was in the X Games going up against Tony Hawk and Burnquest and Bucky Laskett and those guys. And it's like, that's gnarly. That's hard. Like to do both those sorts of the proficiencies that he did. And then he had his band. Like, so he, and now he's got his own brands as Jordan has his own brand. So I hope for John, Sean that his brand can be as big as that because that's huge <laughs> money for Mr. Jordan. Um, yeah, I think that's, I'll stick to that answer. And then female. Barrett, probably Barrett Christie for me coming up the ranks. Like, um, I don't know. How, I think she got, what, 20 medals? She's been to the Olympics a few times. Um, she's still actively involved with the industry. She's up there at Mervyn doing stuff. I saw her at the boarding for uh, breast cancer. She's supporting that group. And I don't know if you guys ever got the opportunity to ride with her. There's definitely been – I've been around the world with her a few times, and I think about it. But there's definitely, there's definitely jumps we were on, and I'll leave these – young men's names off this list <laughs> they wouldn't do it she did and she would dude that was always so inspirational that she would just do it like no questions and she just stick it so you're just like all right i love it there so, it's a great answer yep all right i got a curveball for you who's the mj of snowboard photography uh, who's a german kid um lorenz yeah I'm digging his style. It's so unique yeah, he and different and technical. Shoots some awesome stuff. It's so good. And um, Lorenz Holder? Yeah, that guy. Yeah. Boom. It's he has like that different. one iconic shot of like that big, looks like a space dish yep. or something, and there's a snowboarder doing like an air to fakie. <laughs> but everything I've seen him one do. One like Red Bull Illume. Yep. Uh, Sam Ovidic over there. Mm -hmm. he's a Red Bull shooter. That dude can shoot anything. He was at our photo workshop. We've done that for High Cascade for, gosh, I don't know how many years now, 15 years, Tim when, um Tim, oh, I got dry throat there. Tim's doing it now, but they, um, he's super good too. But then the goats, yeah, Bud, probably Fawcett, you know, I mean, without what he had done early on, we probably all wouldn't be as inspired as we are today or doing different things. So give credit where credit's due. Like, thank you, Mr. Bud. And then he's, uh, he's actually formally retired now. He's old enough to be actually retired. So he's one of my first friends or colleagues that actually claimed the status. I was like, whoa, that's <laughs> too close. <laughs> actually made it. <laughs> yeah, you made it. Good for you. And I love that he's putting up his stuff on Instagram, all the historical stuff. So if y'all get haven't been following him on Instagram, get up there. Bud Fawcett. Awesome. Okay, who's got the best style ever? Um, you know, a lot of people reference Jamie, obviously Jamie Lynn. And just the, I think it's really representative of that era and grunge, just the strength and the power of which he would get through anything and then obviously the method errors that he would pull amazing There's a shot i didn't send down but him at baker that's just another stomping ground for him he's always got good style and then i always like dirksen you know in a pow and just riding with that guy so smooth and quiet and in control when he's riding and just a good just a good human being um to be around so style also includes just post your turn you don't want to make it all about athletics, but just him as a human and individual. And then um, style, yeah. There's so many people with good style. I think those two are very, very yeah. solid answers. Great answers. I love the Dirksen one, too, because we, we get a lot of Jamie. Um, okay, best board graphic ever. Um, mine. No, I don't know. There's, <laughs> um, I've got three pro models, you know. Oh, yeah. It's true. With your photography on them? They're Trevor Gray's Pro Models. Capita gave me one. Really? Yeah, with that Dale Tongue shot on it. Oh, oh sick. Yeah. That's, That's right. dope. Yeah. You can't even do a five, and I got a Pro Model, bitch. 
Um, these, you know, I, I have, I probably even let people know that this board's at my building because I'll probably break in and steal and that may be a compliment, but I'd be bummed. But the brushy fish. Mm. Yeah. So I got his 92 U.S. Open victory board at my office. Wow. Yeah. The victory board. Dude, he's, yeah, he flowed me. I should probably get some certification thing from it, but that one's pretty tight. That was um real cutting edge at the time, just putting that fish on there. And his inspiration, I remember, to Jagger was just bringing the sticker from, you know. A bass shop or something? Yeah, just, yeah, just some <laughs> hardware store or something back in the day in Vermont, and then that inspired that board. And I think they just did a, re, a reissue for it or something. Mm-hmm. So, um. I like that one. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, before that, the graphics were definitely not headed that direction, huh? No, it changed it up quite a bit. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> if you could go heliboarding with three people just for fun, good times, good turns, who are you taking? I love this question. And, again, there's always that networking question. If you could have dinner with anybody alive or dead, who would you have? You know, it's, it, I kind of take it that way. Yeah. But I'd feel the I'd feel the bird a few ways. And, and, how, and, I've, and it makes me think about how I've had the privilege of flying with a lot of people. Got about, I think about 150 hours logged in helicopters. Hey, did you know there's two kind of helicopters? Two kind. Those that have crashed and those that are about to because they all go down. <laughs> Is that the true story? Dude, <laughs> it's like I've almost gotten killed in those things. Sione was in one of them. We were in Juno. We almost went down. And I know one of the dice thing is like pooping your pants or something, but I peed my pants on that one. You did. You actually oh, yeah. peed your I pants. I peed my pants on that one. You were that close to going down. We did. We were falling. We were in Juneau, Alaska, sunny day. You know how it is when the sun finally comes out. And you're like, we're going to get it. And we, um, they switched out our pilot. So instead of having, let's say, a Vietnam-era pilot, which Alaska is famous for, mm-hmm. we got a Medvac pilot. You know, very, you know, doctory looking lawyer kind of guy. Sure, he's proficient, but he didn't understand mountains and wind shear and what a cornice is. And he put the bird down on top of a cornice, and it broke. So Sean Dog's getting it out. He's literally like stepping out, and then it cracks, and we start vertically falling off the mountain. And below you is literally salt water. It's the, it's the sound. And I just, you know, a little tinkle came out. Wow. I thought we were done. And then he hits the bird, and you hear that engine just whack, 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 whack. We pull up out of it. You're it's supposed like, to do what they call a tow in, right? Where you well, yeah, you hover. he's supposed to be in. He's, you kind of just hover and don't yeah, set down. You don't set down, and he did. And then we, he should have been. He should have been probably 10, 15 feet in on the dirt, not on the cornice. But yeah, he didn't, just he put didn't it know. right there in the yeah, big abbey. Looks safe, desert. like dude, you just about killed Dave Sione. That would have not been cool. Wow. Uh, so, and who would I put in the bird? So I thought about it again, live or dead, I'll take it that way. But again, it'd be fun to go back in time, put Jake Burton, Tom Sims, and um, Mike Chantry in a bird and see what the hell happens. Wow. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, um, I've seen a few fights with those guys. I always felt like divorced parents having a fight when Tom and Jake would get into it. But um, that'd be interesting. The other one is like I'd fill it up with um, – all my photo buddies and get plenty of good shots of me ripping, <laughs> you know, get Zachary in there and Cole and <laughs> fill it with your like favorite Divian photographers, <laughs> get you guys in there. Like, you know, okay, look at how good I'm ripping. And pow, like, cause it's like, there's no pictures of me. I've had some amazing road trips. There's no pictures of me. Sometimes in the video, you can you're see always on the, shooting the photo, right? <laughs> yeah. You're always at the, always the guy <laughs> with the camera. So yeah, that's what I would do with those guys. And then obviously you're good bros. You know, Rob Morrow has always been a fun friend to ride with and Jake, uh, um, it'd always be fun to get in a bird with those guys. So, awesome. No backpack though. No pack. Yeah, no, no pack. pack. No pack needed. Yep. Okay. Last question. Worst trend. What do you got? Trends. Oh, geez. We got a whole crew that keeps up on all that stuff. You have like a trendsetter. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a trendsetter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The um, trend department. Yeah, the trend department. That's tight. Who's head of trend department? <laughs> That'd be a cool title. <laughs> yes, I'm head of trends. <laughs> I'm head of trends here. I'm a trendsetter. Designs. Yeah, it's like um, <laughs> I guess it's like having people on social media that just shouldn't be there. Period. You know, it's, it's like um, we've watched through the pandemic, and it's just it's a whole other political conversation we have at dinner. But I think there's there's again a back to authenticity. And there's a responsibility as media people to be have your shit dialed. When people get on that thing and they don't know what the hell they're talking about, and then it starts going the wrong way it's so irresponsible i think even as let's call our little industry is snowboarding i remember that one guy split up a sequence and sent it to both trans world and snowboarder and got called out and fired you don't even know who he is anymore 
he got he got lit up in can because he just didn't do it right. Wow. And um, yeah, it's just like you know, anybody can like it's like not anybody can be a doctor, but it feels like we're in an environment like oh, anybody can be a doctor. It's like anybody can be a media <laughs> company. I was like, mm-hmm. no, it's just some responsibility in what you do. Um, I wish it wasn't so sloppy. Love that. Good answer. Okay, we always ask our guests uh, what their setups are. What board are you riding? Bindings, all that. Two boards, uh, depending. Again, you got to pick the right tool for the right conditions, right? So when I go pow, Dirksen gave me a um, six stick with a McFedrick graphic on it. So it was a little bit older, but I got um, uh, um, the Burton cartel bindings on it. And I got some Burton boots. I got some Nike boots that I wear too. And then I got... My, uh, we'll call it my, just my regular board. It's actually a Palmer, I forgot what it's called. It's high end. It's like a $1,500 board, PHX 7,500 with the step on, the Burton step in binding. So that's what I use when I go to Bachelor or up to Hood or just riding resorts. I get lazy. It rides pretty good though. It's fine. <laughs> I've heard those are coming a long way. So they are. It's like, like a little clicky noise, but it's like, Again, just just ripping around with your friends after work, like it's fine, it's fun. So, <clears throat> those are my two setups. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and I actually helped design that graphic too, by the way. So, which the one, the Palmer one or yeah, the, the Palmer one? Nice, the yeah. Palmer or the Step On. You know, the Palmer one. <laughs> I got some free Step Ons early on though. All those guys they hooked me up, so it's like cool. I still got some flow. <laughs> still getting spots. I still have a good time making fun of those things, even though I'm sure they work great. Um, Wait till you get to be. Yeah, you get to 50 and we'll have this conversation <laughs> again, creeps. okay? A special bombcast about you riding those findings and boots, okay? <laughs> I'll tell you, I am famous for eating my words. Like, every, everything I talk shit on, fast forward two years. So true. Huh? I'm just, I'm like all in on it. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I will be in step-ons in about two and a half years. That's a fact. Um, also, what's next? What do you got next on the docket? Next is um, summer's finally here. Can't wait. Uh, vacations. Well, next here is like I'm leaving right now, going up to um, Powder Mountain to shoot the North Face stuff for Nemo's one of our clients. So we'll get up there and shoot all the campaign work for holiday. So that's happening pretty quick. And then um, the fun stuff. I don't know. It's like I'm in <laughs> such locked pandemic mode, dude. And it just like it kind of slows you down in a weird way. I've been, you know, I used to flying all the time, and now it's like Portland got a whole new wing of airport I didn't even know was there. I'm like, wow, where the hell am I? Salt Lake's got an amazing airport. Where would you go? Where should I go? I just went to Mexico and went surfing. It was awesome. Yeah. Let's go down and check Sweezy's place out in Mexico. That'd be cool. What's he got going on down there? He's got a um, like a yoga retreat kind of place, surf oh, cool. kind of place down there in the Baja Peninsula. So that's pretty sweet. Christine Sperber's got one down that way, too. I don't know if you remember her from mm-hmm. back in the day. She was first down there. Michelle Taggart's place in Costa Rica. Jan Roy. Been down there with the family. they got a whole thing going now. That's uh, nice. All the snowboarders just getting these little yoga retreats. and Yeah, good on them. You yeah. move. Living the sweet life. Yeah, Eat fish tacos, do some yeah. yoga, and get pounded by some waves. That sounds Great. awesome. <laughs> Could be worse, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, one more thing before we get out of here. We always ask our guests thank yous. Do you have any? Thank you, Dad, for giving me some good advice on never settling and following your passions uh, for the work, uh, the work career. Appreciate giving a little horn there. Yeah, big old air horn. Thanks, Pops. And um, I thank my business partners for putting up with me and just being a great partner at Nemo. Um, Jeff Bartell, my business partner, I've seen. I've been, he's been my brother now for, he's the one adult I've been around and been with more than anybody in the world in a weird way if you actually add up the hours, so. Thank you. I totally appreciate that. Uh, thanks for Doug Palladini, actually, and giving me um, the confidence to come on at Snowboarder first early on and just giving me the free reign to do the editorial stories that I wanted to do early in my career at Snowboarder Magazine as a senior writer and shooter. That was really an inspirational part of my career. Um, thanks for the wife putting up with me and all the uh, hard hours that I do put in. That, um, yeah, it must be hard to be around me, I guess. <laughs> Hopefully not. That's all I could think of. There's so many, you know, and you think about all the riders that have just put up with all the shoots that I want to do um, and just being there and then them being passionate about making their careers happen. So they're wanting to be in front of the camera, you know, with Brushy, Jason Ford, uh, Noah, 
Andy Coughlin, um, Eric Webster even. I don't know if you guys know him. He's here in town, but he let me stay at his place early on. All that stuff helps. All those little things early on totally make these uh, paths in the road that help you get to where you want to be and successful. Um, thanks, Danny Kiwi Meyer, for putting on the Crystal Awards. Like That helped me close the end of my photo career and ultimately being what I consider the best photographer. And when you're, if you haven't seen that contest, it's all the best shooters in the world get together in Switzerland and go head to head and, and they vote for whoever is the best. And I got to be the best that year. So check got that, that 12 year old kid made his goal. <laughs> uh, and he made that venue, uh, possible for me. So thank you. Amazing. Well, I'll tell you what, it's been a great chat with you, Trevor. I want to say thank you for coming on the show. First of all, and thank you for everything you've done for snowboarding. We really appreciate it. And thank you guys for what you're doing. I think the composite is uh, should be in the Smithsonian at some point to represent what we're doing. <laughs> Evil Knievel's there. Tony Hawk's got to be a board there. Like this should be there representing us. As an industry <laughs> That's awesome. Because you guys got a lot of. There's so many of us as a community that are, are being represented. What you're doing here, so it really is awesome. Keep going. Thank you. Much appreciated. And lastly, I do got to say thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our Patreon members. And of course, thank you to everybody that listens or watches our podcast. You guys rule. We got another podcast coming at you next week. Over and out from the bomb hole.